course here on this subject. Uh, thank God this is being recorded. Anybody who is it can go ahead and uh, you know view it or see it online. One of our sisters said to me that uh, she's been working all night and that uh, what she did in the Wednesday and the Thursday was that when she came back in the night, she went, she went through all the videos for what the week on Wednesday. When she came back in the early morning of uh, Friday, that was yesterday, she went through all the videos of what happened on Thursday. So the recording is there, even though, you know, we expect everybody to be here, we have done our part. Uh, you know, I think it was uh, Pastor Lubidi Manuel that shared uh, something with us of when uh, Reverend Ron Kennedy, sorry, not Pastor Lubidi Manuel, I remember when Pastor Lubidi Manuel went to meet Pastor Ron Kennedy somewhere when he was, uh, let me not say what happened. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But a pastor in Omaha, Nebraska, organized the program and invited Ron Kennedy to minister. And when Ron Kennedy got there, there were six people. Praise the Lord. The sick people included Ron Kennedy himself, the pastor and his wife, their three children, and one more person. God is faithful. I said, God is faithful. The church is marching on. We are very blessed this morning to have, uh, please uh, give me one. Thank you. This, this, uh, to have this man of God here. Uh, I've said uh, a lot to you about this man of God. We are very, very blessed to be associated with him. I've known him for quite some time by the grace of God. And I've learned a lot simply by observing you know, him at the close distance and the way he does things. And so I'm very blessed to uh, you know, introduce to you Pastor Ladiku for Clement. Two things or three things I will say. Uh, number one is that, oh, okay, so Prince commented on this. Okay, are you okay? Praise God. You know, uh, Pastor Clement, Pastor Oladipu for Clement is uh, one of the pastors under the leadership of uh, uh, the man of God, Pastor Louis Dave Manuel. Uh, he pastors their, the branch of their church uh, in somewhere in Lagos called Magada. Am I correct, sir? So he pastors that church, and uh, by the grace of God, they have results. These men and women that God has sent to us this week, they have results. Pastor, a lot of people has results. I would not have brought him if he didn't have results. And so today, what he's going to teach us is how to create wealth. Wealth creation. It takes a process. It takes poverty. Anybody want to create poverty too? It takes a process. <laughs> All you have to do is just wake up, go back and sleep. Wake up, go back and sleep. Don't do anything. A little sleep, a little slumber. The Bible says poverty enters into that person's life and family. So that's a process to create poverty. There is a process to create wealth. He is the CEO, the founder, and the group CEO of Life Page. I hope you guys have gone to search Life Page. Uh, let me just stop and just, because of time, because I know we have to finish this on time, let's just uh, rise up in honor of God. In the life of Pastor Olagi Kupo Kwemi has been. The truth of the matter is, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. So, if I need to come up, please take your seat. Thank you very much. Praise God. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want to thank you. I can actually 
need to be right without any of it. Um, and so, and I must say that on the position of arrogance, that is something I've been doing, I've been doing, and it's something I tried. You know, for God. Uh, but before I proceed, let me say that I want to deeply, deeply, deeply honor Pastor Sam and his lovely wife for the hospitality. I'm not supposed to come here. Forgive me. For those of you who don't understand me, forgive me. Right? Um, but I, I'm really, really delighted to be here. Um, thank you so much for the honor and privilege of my job. Um, this is church, and so because I'm, I'm a bivocational pastor who puts the marketplace on ministry, um, there are things that if I understand, because I Day to day to day, I, I can relate well with all our church members. So I know what to go through. Same thing with Pastor Sam and Joe, right? And that's the beauty of having bi-occasional pastors. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a full time pastor, don't get me wrong. Um, but I learned other things about it, wasting my time. I too was fine. The Sam was good. Right, so I want to take us through a process, but let's start with third journey. And then yesterday night was awesome. It was awesome. I was sitting with my wife this morning and I called, called, I was telling her, let's get to what to do. Pastor was very vulnerable with Paul. He shared quite a number of things that we need to fit to. I don't get to have a teenager as a child. But this year now we are full teenagers. So there's no need to hurry up. This training is only for if in church what you do does not marry the money. Again, let me also put a disclaimer out. It is impossible to complete the session um, in the time frame that we have. That's why I came with my book. By the grace of God, I don't die on the book that I need to survive. Um, I also have courses because again, I'm very passionate about this. My life calling. For those who do not know, it's my life calling. I'm calling to die with poverty. Amen. That's my calling. That's my calling. It took me a couple of years. Anybody who has known me for upwards of 20 years will tell you that this is one thing I've been consistent with this time. Right? And I've been doing that. Um, I've hosted different kinds of programs. Um, and then even our branch of our church is called the Worthy Place. <laughs> so, all right. So, so let's get right into this. So third John verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as your soul prosper. Can I have a backup, please? Backup. I have a tribe. I'm echoing. I have a tribe called the tribe of wealthy origin. And the purpose of setting up that tribe of building that community was so that the physical 
Bible was a tangible world. In the soul. So nothing happens in the physical. It doesn't just happen in the spirit. And it transitions through the mind of man. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I have a course also called the Life Plan Course. Um, many years ago when I hear people say <laughs> things like um, they have a 30-year plan, 50-year plan, I used to wonder, how can somebody develop a 50-year plan? You are not good, how can you figure out everything in details? But somewhere along the line, I stumbled on, on, on some materials to develop a plan. So I developed a 30-year plan myself. And I completed the first 10 years of that plan when I clocked 40, two years ago. And truth is, I realized that not many people even have an understanding of that, even in church. So I decided to turn it into a, a program, a course. And in that course, I shared specifically, and the reason I'm doing this foundation, don't forget where we started from, 3 John verse 2. And that's what's leading us. So don't, 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 get, um, don't get distracted. So I used to tell people, a life plan is superior to a financial plan. A life plan is superior to a career plan. A life plan is far more superior to, um, than, than a financial plan. So as important as this class and this session is, having a life plan is more holistic. It captures all those other details. But that now brings me to this. When that member of our tribe raised the question about what exactly to be the order in which we should organize our lives and you know and determine for our pursuit in life i didn't even waste time i usually don't comment in that tribe i only drop my own post and then i go because my schedule can be crazy so but that day i was just felt i felt i needed to say something so this is number one this is this is this Listen to me carefully, please, people of God, we are in church. Anyone that you see that is trolling the place and commands any measure of wealth is not a regular human being. <laughs> see, your heart is far more intelligent than your head. There are things that you will never find in any book what will be the own secret to your own breakthrough. Yes. Wow. And so the extent to which you develop your spirit is critical. Very, very important. You can never be limited if you work on this. It's the core, it's the foundation. It drives literally everything else. So whether, I mean, my, my father in the Lord, Pastor Louis Emmanuel, would always say that you are either in a secret place or you are in the secret court. You are either in a secret place or you are in a secret court. Choose one. But you can't be the video guy. Just be a meat. Just be you be a prey in the hand of the enemy. So, so but to succeed financially speaking and all ramifications, you need power. And this is very this is where faith comes in. So you have to feed your faith. You have to grow it intentionally. I hope you know that for those of us who are familiar with farming, you know that. Uh, weeds grow on their own accord yes. without input. Yes. But to have fruit, there has to be a high degree of intentionality. Yes. Am I communicating? Yes. I'm still laying foundation. So you see, if foundation laying is still taking me so much time, I wonder when we we'll get into the But <laughs> well, God will help us. Amen. Now, after faith is fitness. Listen to me carefully, follow this. This is serious business. It's fitness. And I mean emotional, mental, and physical fitness. And if you notice something, it's still about you. Every faith is you. Fitness, who? You. 
You know why this is so important? You are the most important critical success factor in the journey of your life. Are you following something? Yes. The next one is family. So I see particularly our mothers. Um, I love my mother so much and I love my wife. You know, Pastor, I did something so tomorrow this morning. My wife called me. Um, Atlanta, Georgia is one hour ahead here. So she called me and I pretended as though it was a girl, a lady that was speaking. I've never done that kind of a thing in my life before. <laughs> never. But well, I just, I don't know what even came over me. And the shocking thing was that I thought she would recognize it was me. And she said, sorry, I want to speak with Mr. Clement. <laughs> I wanted her to laugh, so I just hung up. So she died again. And then, just, the moment she called again, I just spoke with my regular voice. I said, who was the person that put the girl in there? I said, I couldn't laugh. But where am I actually going? A lot of our mothers, a lot, I tell my wife this also, and all mothers should listen to this, all fathers, all men should listen to this. You, the tanker that supplies fuel needs fuel too. Yes. 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 If you are not in good condition, you can't serve all that well. Am I communicating here? Absolutely. See, if we end this here, I think we are good. Yes, sir. Uh, this, this is very important. I know why I'm saying this. Because I recognize the I know I understand the objective for this conference. And from what Pastor shared yesterday, I could relate very, very well. And I deal with lots of issues. I consult, I counsel, I do pastoring work is an uncelebrated work. Oh, yeah. uh, so anyway. <laughs> so family next. So when you are fine spiritually, you're fine emotionally, mentally, physically, then you can have your family well. So third. The next one, I mean. This is tribe of worldly origin. And they were asking questions that bordered on order of things. They were expecting me to come and say it's finance. Can I shock you? You don't attract what you want. You attract who you are. Yes, sir. If there is anything you should take away from this, this meeting tonight, today, is that you don't attract. So if you go back to that scripture, beloved, I pray that you prosper. So it's God's delight. God wants you and I to prosper. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that it delights in the prosperity of his servants. So God will never be excited that you are poor. But he gave us the condition for it. That's what I'm talking about this. As your soul prospers. So the condition for the other prosperity that people can see, touch and feel, is the prosperity of the soul. But that's often neglected. I have a principle. So every year, it's a tradition, it's, a, it's part, of my, part of my daily routine, um, is to read my Bible. So every year, Bible in one year, it's a normal tradition, praying the Spirit, fasting. It's a normal thing because you never can tell what is coming in life there are things you can control in life there are other things you can control and as an individual one of the things i've learned to understand i go through challenges too i'm sure that nobody is immune to challenges all of us are including those of us who pray and fast in fact like our own is usually more but what i found out is this if I wasn't doing that, I probably would have even been taken off. I've been eliminated long ago. Anyways, so family. So the prosperity of the soul or your prosperity financially depends on the prosperity of your soul. That's why I'm talking about you. You are the most important critical success factor. Always remember that. The next one is friends. Now, Faith is talking about your 
vertical relationship, your relationship with your Creator. When God was to create plants, He called them out of the soil. In order for plants to remain, vi um, to maintain their vitality and nutrient, they have to stay connected, connected to the soil. Mm -hmm. True or false? When God was to create fish, um, aquatic animals, He called them out of the water. If you just want to frustrate a fish, you don't need to do too much. Just disconnect it from its source. Period. It's just a matter of time it will die. Guess what? When God wants to create you and I, He created us and called us out of Himself. Genesis 1.26 Let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. The point is this. The devil knew that as long as we stay rooted in God, he has no power over us. Hallelujah. So he introduced sin to disconnect us, to sever that relationship. So Jesus came to restore that relationship, to reconcile us back. Hello? Hello the scripture says in Genesis, God came in the cool of the evening to interact with man and all of those things. Now, this is so important. If I were to teach this in a regular uh, corporate setting, I probably would not go into all of these other scriptural dimensions. But this is church, and it's important for us to have this scriptural background. Now, note this. So, every time you place priority on the creature and the creation, when God created something, please follow me carefully, please. Yes. I, I really wish we had more time. Right. But even I have a second session I need to rush into. <laughs> but maybe we can continue tomorrow's yes. morning. When God created in Genesis chapter 1, He created three things. He created creation. That's where you have the sun, the moon, the star. Hello? Yes, sir. Planetary system. You will find all of that there. Then you have the creature. That's where you have all the animals. Everything. Do you understand what about that? He created creators. You. And I. Guess what? Your prosperity is tied to being a creator. And it's rooted in your active connection with God. Okay. Are you getting it? Okay. So it has taken me how many minutes now to do this? It's taking me how many minutes? So what? Did you get this? Yes, yeah. yes. understood everything I said. You can't, I can't unwrap un un everything in the limited time we have. Go meditate on that. This is why moving out of Africa does not automatically change your status. No, sir. Yeah. You can say that over and over. A lizard in Nigeria a is a lizard in America. Yes, so until you become a better version of yourself, nothing really changes. Until you change, nothing changes. Yes. Okay, so let's get right into this now. So I'm to talk about wealth creation, and I want to look at it from the perspective of the book I wrote. Uh, because ultimately, you want to attract a lot of wealth. But what's the definition of wealth? I really don't want to go into definitions. I don't want to go into definitions. But if you check Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, mm -hmm. can you pull up? Jeremy 8, for me. I, I want to assume that I don't want to assume that everybody understands that scripture. But let's quickly see what that scripture says. And you shall remember the Lord your God. Faith. Did you see it there? Yes. You shall remember who? The Lord your God. Remember money? No. Your job? No. Your family? No. Your wife? No. Who? The Lord. Faith. Number one. 
when you get that right, the vertical relationship impacts on your horizontal relationship. Anyone you are always having quarrel with, you are always having problem with your spouse, is a signal of your work with God. It's a reflection of how well. Even if they say somebody is proud, I'm wondering, <laughs> proud as how? Did you not read in your Bible? The meek will he guide in judgment. Did you not read in your Bible? Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Did you not read that in your Bible? Yeah. Only poor people are arrogant. <laughs> Truly wealthy people are not. Because they understand that for these things to have be happening, they don't have a clue. We try things that many things that never worked, and some worked. So we're just fortunate. Okay. This is a class. I'm not using preacher's voice. I don't have a preacher's voice. I don't even have one. <laughs> so, so sometimes I can come out as boring. So, but please follow me. So, you shall remember the Lord your God for it. it is He who gives you power to get wealth. What did He give you? Power. Sorry, I thought it was wealth. So God does not give power. Uh, sorry, God, God does not give wealth. He gives. He gives the. The intangible equivalent of the material. So it gives you ideas. It gives you it gives you inspiration. It gives you talents. Can you touch your talent? <laughs> Can you touch your gifts? It gives you capacity. It gives you intellect. There are people who have special intelligence. They can tell you the measurement of this room, the length and breadth of this room, because that's special. That's their own kit. There are some people who, when it comes to numbers, add any number you like. They will give you, multiply it by and divide it several times over. They will give you the figure. That is the one God gave them. But you know, it's unfortunate. People who have those levels of intelligence, those dimensions of intelligence, they are still serving tables. Woo! Chasing after the things that should be chasing after them. If you forgot anything in this service, in this conference, don't forget that God delights in your prosperity. So, it gives you power to get well opportunities. It's one of those powers that will bring you away. And guess the purpose of giving you that power? That he, he, not you, that he may establish his covenant. So, at the end of the day, it's for kingdom purpose. So, that takes me to this. Holy Spirit, thank you. That takes me to these five stages in your journey to financial freedom. So I'm talking about journey to financial freedom. That's what I'm talking about. Also, I hope I'm not out of journey. No, that's fine. Okay. So I'm going to take it from bottom up. The reason why I love, I don't like, just like Pastor said yesterday, I don't like um, PowerPoints, all those slides. I don't, I don't enjoy it. Because people derive more value from me when I speak from my heart. You can't forget what you do, do you? They can't forget what you do. So let me run you through the five stages. Now the essence of these five stages is for you to be really be able to derive as much value in my session today and tomorrow morning is to clearly ascertain where you are in any of the stages. Because the sincerity and uh, the sincerity and your honesty will determine whether or not you will embrace some of the truths and recommendations that you have. I tell you the truth, the worst form of deception is self-deception. Yes. Anybody can deceive anybody. Yes. But don't deceive yourself. Uh -huh. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Yes. Are you feeling me? Yes. I'm feeling myself, sir. <laughs> the first thing from bottom up is financial crisis. So forgive me, um, just, I just need to pull this through. Financial crisis. Now, 
This financial crisis is a state where the person is not making income. By the way, this is the book. Okay, first of all. So this, this is the book of which I'm sharing from. And so you know that this you can't finish this. I can't I can't finish that. But we have just a few copies in the back there, at the back. But please, I didn't come to sell book. But I can't finish it as I'm telling you about the book. It is point in your life where you are not making income. But well, you know all of us are gifted spenders. <laughs> you didn't think about it. Yes. We are all talented. Yes. It's spending. Yes. It's, a, it's, it's, a natural. it's natural. It's natural. Whether you make money or not. And listen to this carefully. There are three things that will happen when you don't make money. Should I tell you what it is? Yes. Number one, you start begging. When you run out of people to beg from, then you start borrowing. And when you run out of people to borrow from, then that's when compromise sets in. Yes. And then you are more prone to stealing, yeah. taking what does not belong to you. And you know, none of these three options is honorable. Mm -hmm. So, financial crisis is you are not making money, but you, you're spending. So, so, it's a not good area to be. But what I've come to discover is that it's also possible to be in financial crisis and be worth billions of dollars. So if you have assets, fixed assets, I'm sure Pastor will understand this better. <laughs> if you have fixed assets, worth billions or billions of dollars, but there is too low or not no cash flow or liquidity, you also have financial crisis. True or false? So you can be worth millions of dollars in assets, but that's not convertible to cash flow, that is not cash flow positive, or that is not generating cash flow at all. You know you can have assets that is not generating cash flow. Yeah. And you can have cash flow generating assets. Yes. They are two different things. Yeah. So those two classes of people are the people that you can be in. So you need to ask yourself, where am I? That's the reason for this. This diagnosis. Next one is financial, what did I say? Financial instability. Financial instability is that point in one's life where your take home doesn't take you home. Did you get that one? Yes. So you are always running from paycheck to paycheck. It's like the book up, the, the pace at which your, your expenses is running faster than your income. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Yes, yes. That's financial instability. Uh, according to a report, this is a data concerning Nigeria, that 75% of Nigerians and less than 100,000 naira a month. Yep. 75? 75%. Wow. That's, that's less than 150 dollars a month yeah. here. Yeah. Now, and there are people who have three, four children mm. and earn less than that in Nigeria. Anyways, it, the, the, the figures may vary from nation to nation, but what I found out is financial instability is financial instability. So it will vary from place to place, but that's what it is. So define, tell me where you are. The next one is financial stability. Forgive my writing. The goal is not for me to pass a written test, but just to illustrate. Financial stability is that point where you, you live fairly comfortable. So at this point, you maintain some degree of financial equilibrium. So your monthly obligations is not more than $5,000, $10,000 a month. And you do some between around 10, 11, 10,500 a month. And so you can balance out, right? 
if you live in Nigeria, like we were discussing yesterday, right, to live the quality of life that people live here, you have to be a multi billionaire. Yeah. And that is true because there are no standards there. So, to create the standard that you want, you have to pay more because you have to provide the power that government did not provide. You have to create the road infrastructure that government did not provide. So, you have to do the job of government to create the life that you enjoy here. But even somebody who lives on basic uh, earnings here can enjoy that quality of life. Does that make any sense? Okay. So, financial stability. But the danger with this is you are living off your active income. Now, there's a difference between active and passive income. So this is the money that you earn when you work. So if you don't work, you don't earn. If you are not present, I mean, here, <laughs> people are paid per hour, right? So if you don't show, there's no show. <laughs> so now people who at this level mostly live off their active income. So if they don't earn, they don't earn. If, if they don't work, they don't earn. Which makes it very tricky. So being here is a very tricky place to be. Because if anything tampers with your current source of active income, you are back here or here. Unfortunately, people in this category get to that point where they start acquiring things they can't yet afford. So they must get the future. So they are indeed based on this active income. They have bought, like, they have, <laughs> you know, money has past, present, and future. <laughs> so some people have spent the future, so there's no future again. The future now is in the past. So anything they are doing now is just to cover past. So even the present, they don't. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yes, so this is not a good place to be. So it's an average life. This is where most middle class people are. Big cars, big house. But if anything can pass with their back. Four is financial independence. Taking so much time or whatever it is I'm going to be recommending will make more sense when you understand this. These things are laid as foundation. Financial independence is that point in your life where the proceeds from your assets or investments can replace your active income without you working for another day. Hmm? So let me put it another way. Financial independence is the state of your life where the proceeds from your assets and investment is capable of meeting your personal and family needs without you having to work another day. Is that making sense? Yes. yes. There was a research that was carried out years ago here in America and Hundred students were monitored for 40 years, and the goal, the purpose of the, um, the the research was to see how many of them would turn out to be extremely wealthy, how many of them would be fairly wealthy and comfortable, and how many of them would be penniless, how many of them would have. And the report showed that of those hundred people, now, I mean, for those of you who have done masters, you've done some. Search work. I'm sure you are familiar with sample size. So the sample size was 100. So it means it was, if you relate that to 1,000, it will also give you the same result. Mm -hmm. if you relate that with 1 million, it yeah. gives you the same result. So 100 people, out of those 100 people, 1%, that is just one out of this 100, was financially independent. Another 4% were fairly comfortable doing well. That's another four. About 36% were still working for money. 
about, uh, I think, 50, the remaining percentage. Sorry, yeah. I misplaced it. The remaining percentage had died. Died. You know, what kills people is more about the emotions and the pressures of life than money or lack of money itself. The pressure, lack of it creates. Takes people their pedigree. Now that brings me to something very critical. I don't know why I'm talking this way. I believe that pastor, people have prayed here, but let me say this. Do you want to live long? Yes, sir. Absolutely, yes. Learn to have your own inner circle that you can be vulnerable with. And learn to talk to God more regularly. In the place of prayer, we are boarding. We are fluid. And let me say this. The reason a lot of people keep to themselves all of the time is because they don't get their circle, inner circle right. No, this is not finance, but Pastor, can I stay still? Absolutely, please. Please make another verse. So, <laughs> so your, your relationships are supposed to be in three concentric circles. I hope you don't mind my poor drawing. This is the, like the temple, the most holy place. The holies of holies. This is where your inner circle is supposed to be. This is supposed to be the holy place. Another category of religion, and then this is the outer court. Now, guess what? A lot of us now keep to ourselves and no longer vulnerable because we have brought people who are supposed to be in outer court, we have brought them to our inner circle, and they have betrayed us. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Listen to me, your inner circle are not going to endorse your wrong. Woo! But they will never judge you outside. Yes. 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 They will defend you with their life. Mm -hmm. And if you have never prayed for this, start praying for it from today. Pray for yourself, pray for your children, pray for your grandchildren. Mm -hmm. If you get this wrong, this is where your spouse is supposed to be. Unfortunately, some people have also married people. <laughs> God will help us. Amen. Someone listening to this. Now, now, journey to financial freedom. You see how it's touching different aspects of our lives. Yeah. Yes. But you have pursued money so they you have neglected the other areas. Yeah. Yes. And you are wondering why you have not achieved it. I'm still on the journey myself. Oh. So don't think that I came here to come and talk to people. But I am no longer where I used to be. Mm. And this understanding helps me occasionally, from time to time, when I go for my retreat, to retrace my steps. Mm. Where did, am I missing it? I'm correct. The reason why these steps are important is so that you are always going back to review. Right? I'm going there to review. So. People die. I was talking about people who die. People who have died. So these people who have died, they have died as a result of pressure. You remember the the, the son of the prophet who died and creditors came for yeah, his children, his sons in 2 Kings 7. And the widow ran to Elisha for intervention. And Elisha asked, what can I do for you? One of the things that characterizes the ministry of Elijah and Elijah that is quite different is the fact that the ministry of Elijah was the ministry of power. Mm -hmm. The ministry of Elijah was the ministry of wisdom. The beautiful thing about the ministry of wisdom is that you are able to replicate results, produce again and again. So you can produce miracle and repeat the miracle over and over again. Because my time is fast spent and I don't want to miss. Can I end there? Uh, yeah. No, sir. No. <laughs> Elijah asked that woman, I'm conscious of time, and I know we have a second speaker as well. And I also, Lord of God, I 
I have a conversation myself. Yes. <laughs> can we can we keep our questions and if you don't mind, yes, just speak for the next fifteen minutes. I know when your next session is starting. Yes. I mean my time not correct. Oh, oh, eleven forty two. I mean this thing. I can I'm sorry, sir. Oh, okay. Let's keep our question, please, okay. if you don't mind, because he's still just laying the foundation. Okay. So. You can write your questions and we'll get them. We'll okay. Get you, we'll get you to the Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So, thank God. I was looking at this when I saw it, I was scared. Because <laughs> I have about 200 people who will be waiting to hear me again about some session. Now, um, so Elisha asked the woman, what can I do for you? Now, you know one thing that shocked me the most, and if you go meditate on that scripture, Second Kings 7, from 1 downward, you see some very serious things there. Anytime, and that woman was in financial crisis. Mm -hmm. The family was in financial crisis, and I believe that it was that financial crisis that led to the death of the husband. Of the husband. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because you recall, when the woman came before Elisha, she said to Elisha, he said, you know my husband. Was a holy man of God. He sat with a pure heart. There's nothing wrong with piety, but piety is not equivalent to poverty. And Elijah asked the woman a simple question: What do you have? And it's a question I'm asking somebody here today. What do you have? The woman's response will shock you. It's similar to what the majority of people still give and still say till tomorrow. And the woman said, I have nothing except. Meaning that she trivialized what she had. I don't care your financial situation right now. I, I don't care how horrible it is. But God will never put you in a state where you have nothing left with which you can start and initiate a miracle. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Take this for me. This is very, very important. And then, Elijah said, fantastic. Because you see, it is not what you don't have that hinders you. It is what you already have but don't know how to use. So Elijah said to the woman, you know what, give us some recommendations. He said, go to your neighbors, borrow as many containers as possible, you know, take your two children. You know, she, he didn't pray, he didn't say fast, he didn't anoint, he didn't take holy communion, no feet washing, no man to. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But do you know that if the husband has sought the same recommendation, has sought the same intervention, he may not have died? Go mm. back to why people die. Mm. And the majority of us men, so let me speak to, to, to us men. Build your inner circle and talk to God. Mm. Have people you can be vulnerable with. Mm. Oh. Well, I don't know, my head is running mental. No. You need mental. Fitness. You need emotional stability to take quality decisions. Why do you think people subscribe to cocaine, subscribe to drugs, subscribe to drinking, subscribe even to womanize and stuff like that? It's because there's a vacuum, there's, there's a void they need to satisfy. Unfortunately, those things only create temporary, temporary satisfaction. After what your eye will clear. Then you will be back to where you were before. Mm -hmm. And then the more of it you consume, the more you want to take again, the more you consume, the less. So and it leaves you worse than it makes you. Yes. Am I speaking? Yes. Am I connecting? Yes. So the woman went out, sought for help from neighbors, and asked, All right, please give me that your container. Give me this, give me that. And then Elijah gave a final instruction, which is also brings me to the next thing I'm going to get into. That borrow not a few. Mm. Borrow not a few. Listen to me carefully. 
You see, I told you earlier, you don't attract what you want. You attract who you are. What ultimately defines you is your mental capacity. In this life, there's limitless resources. But what determines what you draw from this life is the size of your container. Um, he said, have you ever been to a beach? Is there a beach close here? Lake. Lake. Okay. Lake. But no beach. No beach. No ocean. No. In this state. But there are some in other states. Yes. Okay. If you go to any ocean, it does not matter the container you take there. The ocean will not dry up. That's how life is. Life is like that ocean. Never runs dry. But what determines what you draw from it is the container you bring. So if you go with a 35 centiliter bottle, and that person goes with 25 liter gallon, and that person goes with 10,000 liter tank, who we'll come out of that place with different quantities of water. But you know what determines it? The size of our thinking. So, what this reveals, this particular statistics reveals, what it reveals is the fact that the population of people who get here are few. That's what I'm trying to show with this. But it's, it's possible to get here? Absolutely. If you do the things that move them there, if you become and do the things that move them there, and I'm going to get to that. And then the fifth level is financial freedom. Now, for many years, I I, I interchanged these two for the other, but they are two they are separate. They are different. Why financial independence is the point in your life where the proceeds from your asset or investment is capable of meeting your personal and family needs without you having to work another day. This one, financial freedom, is the point in your life where the proceeds from your asset and investment is not only capable of meeting your personal and family needs, but it's also able to extend goodness and kindness to others. And that is where you will experience true fulfillment. I was I saw a stumble on a video online and then the guy was saying something, was interviewed and he said, How much do you earn a year? The guy said, Yes, a million dollars. I said, Whoa, a million dollars a year? Yeah. He said, so tell me, what's the happiest moment of your life? He said, when I was four. When he did when he didn't earn that kind of money was when he has his happiest moment. He said, because he had time for his family. And they had time for him. It was very shocking. Man. Is it possible to have both? Oh, absolutely. It's about priority. For those of us who labor hard, it's quality time at home, quantity time at work. Quality time at home, quantity time at work. So financial freedom is the ultimate. And because at the end of the day, you will not be remembered for how many houses you built. You will not be remembered for how many cars you built. You bought, or you'll be remembered for your impact. So life is not just about income, it's about impact. Because that's ultimately what you'll be remembered for. Am I still communicating here? Yes, sir. Ah, man. Okay. So, you see, active income is what characterizes financial stability and everything below. Passive income is what characterizes these people and this people. So financial independence, financial freedom, their goal is passive income. When money is working for them, when, whether they work or not, so they work for fun, not for necessity. At this, from this level below, you are still working for necessity. This is what we call the rat race. a lot of things. 
So let's move out from here. We've laid the foundation. So let's start building. And we can continue tomorrow. Um, can I wrap up with some critical things? Okay, the thoughts. I thought somebody wanted to write something. Okay. So how do you transition from wherever you find yourself in this in any of these stages to the most desirable? That is the focus of my session. So if it took me one hour <laughs> to do foundation laying, you can bet that it will take me longer to do that. But note this. So transition. I use a this is the framework I use, the triangle of life. It's called B do achieve. And this framework suggests that who you become impacts on what it is you do. And what you do consistently is what determines what you achieve. So who you become refers to your mindset, your belief systems, your thought pattern. Are you following my point? What are the thoughts that preoccupies your mind? You can't attract abundance with scarcity mindset. If you think about all the monies you don't have all of the time, that's a big reason you are not really attracting something as much as you desire. Are you following me? So, being. So this is where the being is. And there are a number of things that will help you to become. Two, I will recommend anytime, any day is about relationships and so I'm talking about your association and your information. Those two helps in you to become because you need to become a superior version of yourself to achieve what you've never achieved before. How many of you remember the, the um, mainframe, the mainframe computer? There was a, like a whole building, yes, it can't deliver what some of our phones can deliver now, yeah. in terms of capacity. Yes. And even the phones we carry about today have periodic updates. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the people carrying it are not updating themselves. Oh. And are wondering why, when they bring in extra load, it's like you won't, you won't punch. Several years ago, I, I went through a period of being overwhelmed. I was much, much younger, maybe about 25 or so, there about at the time. So I went to see my mentor to seek counsel about how to deal with the pressures I was dealing with. I, didn't, I wasn't married, I didn't have so much, I didn't have, I didn't have anything, nothing was really, but I was doing a lot. So he asked me a simple question, which I'm still here. Hope you are following me. I'm doing this so that you have pictures in your mind and you can relate. And so uh, he asked me a simple question. He said, when a generator, I mean, for those of us who live, who live in Africa, you're familiar with generating sets. That's the only way you can put power in your house. When the national grid fails you. <laughs> I'm sure some people will just wonder what's generator, what power generator? What? So he asked me then, what, what's it, what's the, so when the generator is jerking, what could be responsible for that? And I said, ah, maybe the load is too much. Or maybe four is about to go off or something. Eh? He said, okay, so, so if, it's, if it is the load that is too much, so what do you do to it? Do you need more fuel? Or do you... More, more fuel? I said, no. He said, more engine oil? I said, no. He said, so what do you do? I said, we either reduce the load or you get a bigger generator. He said, hey, go and increase your capacity. That was my deliverance. Did you get it? You go and increase your capacity. Today, I carry more load. Far more load than people even think. The things I, even me, I'm an amazement to myself. 
I shot myself. <laughs> and let me tell you this. When you are already getting overwhelmed, you are already moving to another level. You know, when uh, a, a regular transmission, manual transmission car, not the automatic transmission, a manual transmission car, when it wants to change gear, it always gets to really, There's always that, uh, you remember what I'm talking about? And then there's that friction. So when you are, when you are that verge, it means that you either go back or you go forward. What a lot of people do is they go back and they wonder, they are always in that cycle. So what we should be doing, I'm giving all this, using this metaphor. So to understand who you must become. So every time you state the level you want to get to, ask yourself, you need to first become the person that achieves it. You want to build a multi-billion dollar business, first become the person and build it. Make that your priority. The other things will follow. Does that make any sense? Yes. Because of our time? Yeah. What you do are the, is about the behavioral pattern, the things, the habits, the things that you begin to do, the steps you need to take. And let me say this. Here, that's why I begin to talk about money management, making the money. Because here, we talk about the mindset. Once the foundation of mindset is laid, the next important step to take is how do you make the money how do you manage the money? You can't manage money or multiply money you have not yet made. Mm -hmm. So it should not give the tools, the keys. All of that are also contained in the book. We understand. And particularly in the course, the course is more elaborate. Um, and then when you do those things, you have become the kind of person that does them. A dog does not require a hazard to back. It's its nature. Yeah. It's natural to it. If you play the, if you be, if you are a cartoonist, a, a cartoon, you play a cartoon character. You will need and you need to play the cartoon character of a dog. You need to rehearse backing to play it accurately. True or false? True. But if it's a dog, it doesn't require that energy. It is natural. When you become it, doing will become natural, and automatically achieving will be the result. Uh, let me rest my case. Yes. We we'll look into other things tomorrow. Thank you. Let's thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Please, have a seat, sir. Please, okay. go ahead and have a seat. Let's celebrate this. Praise the Lord. Let's take one or two questions at most, two at most. But before we take those two questions, because he has to make another teaching or presentation in 30 minutes. Uh, so we have to release him to, he's going to go to the conference room and do that while we do our second session here. Uh, our instructor has arrived, I've seen her back there. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. This book I just check online, it's about $20 online. Uh, do, you, do you sell it at $20 or do you sell it more? Okay, so it's, it's actually $20. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to do because I know this is a real, I mean, we spend time working for the money, but spend little or no time at all studying about the money that we're working for. So I want to recommend, just a sincere recommendation, that people should subscribe for the course, the fuller version. Okay. And then what I'm also doing, is anybody who takes, who takes that course, I'll give you the vision board course because it's also part of the critical part of the uh, creating the world, um, the life plan course, okay. how to really develop plans for your life, you know, and then winning a business, all of that put together for free. So you, once you pay for the course, financial freedom course, you get all of that and including the book. Okay. What? What? How much is the subscription? So it's not really a subscription. Once you pay for it, it's a digital course. Okay. So once you take, you pay for that. So what you should do, maybe you should send a, a text to um, 470. Let me just do that. To that. Please help us start maybe. at the back. Help us start to the screen. They will, that should okay, you can write it here. 470. 
0 okay? Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on now, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I, I think that, being that this is the first time we're doing this uh, empowered conference, uh, you know, one of the one of the things we do internally is when we have a conference, go back and look at what did we do right, like quality assurance, quality check, or some what did we do right, what went right during this conference, what could we have done differently, uh, what are we going to do differently in the next one? I can already tell you that I have two or three things we're going to do differently in Empower 2024 which will take place in November, between November and December of this year, because this conference was to have taken place last year to prepare us for this year. But one way or the other, we're having it now. It's a blessing. One of the, one of the takeaways we're going to do is not bring this type of man of God and have him teach for one hour and fly back to Africa or fly back to Atlanta. That does a great injustice to the class, like even what I thought last night, I still have, I could still have thought it for the next four hours, what I've written down, then I spent the entire two, three days writing and developing and stuff that I didn't get to. So what we're going to do differently is to make sure that we don't overload. If we're just going to have one teacher, one minister or two at the most, they will teach in the morning, they will teach in the evening. They will teach in the morning so they will have time because what I'm hearing, even though I'm a financial guy, right? This is, this is powerful. This is powerful, you know. And man of God, thank you so much. You know, Pastor, Pastor a lot of people, was, his ticket was already bought by himself to go to Nigeria. He lives in Atlanta, right? And he was going to travel. And once I picked the phone and said, Pastor, we need you in Arkansas. That was it. You have to change the date. We cannot buy the gift of God upon your life. We can only say thank you to you. I know you are a very blessed man. A very, very blessed man. You know, uh, one of your friends, I don't know what, where he is in your circle, Pastor Ezekiel. I don't know. <laughs> I can guess. I know where he is, okay? We were, we were, we were in Nigeria in June and we were at a, a training uh, together. And I saw him, I was joking with him. He has this bracelet, something like what I'm wearing. And I said, man, I'm going to take it off and put it into my hand. This guy took it off. I said, no, 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 I was just kidding. He said, no, you have to take it. I said, no, he said, there is nothing we have that we cannot give. And that sank into my head, like, wow. And between him, I don't know if I should, I should say this, but between him and you, I love the way you honored your pastor recently. You know, these two guys bought two brand new vehicles, not cars. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, not cars. Brand new. As we saw it, how you blessed us and how you honor Pastor Louis de Emmanuel. He bought this massive SUV. I was scared when I said, what? And a pilot car to say, let's give honor to the man who has taught us and has brought us by the grace of God to where we are today. And they gave it to him. What a great way. You will be honored, sir. Amen. God will honor you. Amen. Men will honor you. I will go any question because in eight minutes I'm going to release him. Oh, my daughter here. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Use this. So. I have a question about like identity. So you were talking about how to be something you have to change. So can a dog change into a human being if they want to like improve themselves and like you know like move up in the you know chain and like get better? So are you saying we should change our identities to uh, you know change where we're at to improve? Okay, I, from what you said, I can answer. Okay. All right, so fantastic question. I noticed you were paying attention, so, and you were a major encouragement to me. <laughs> so, because your eyes were on me, you were feeling something out, I could see the attention, yeah. Um, so, I, I only used dog um, as a metaphor that when you become the type of a person 
that draws um, that produces certain kinds of results. I, I just gave you an instance of when I was struggling, I was overwhelmed. Um, at that level, there was it was very impossible. No matter the dream I had, it was impossible with the capacity I had at the time to be able to attract the level of results I had dreamt. So I needed to grow my capacity to the level of my dream. So you understand that. But also note that no animal, right, has that's why of all the works of, of all the works of creation, man is the only, you know, creation of God. Like I said, creator of God or creature of God, whichever one wants to look at it. Uh, that has experienced civilization. And lion's kingdom has remained the lion king. That's not they don't cut there, they don't have shampoo, if they say they are their mode of living from time they were all created still the same. So they can't change their identity. The only way you can change yours is to invest in quality relationship and um, studies, developing yourself. So I read like Jackal. Last year I read over 100 books. Do you understand? This year my target, that's apart from all of that, um, reading financial materials, um, reports, you know, and all of those things. All the business you are running, you will have to know the state of your flock. <laughs> So apart from that, so my target this year is not to read 100 books. My target this year is to attain a place of mastery on anything I decide to study. So I'll be reading some books 100 times this year. Mm -hmm. I will study on, because until you really have gained mastery, you don't know it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the challenge for a lot of us is that we are stacking lack of mastery on another lack of mastery. And that's why we implode, not even explode, we implode when a bigger load comes upon us. So my aim this year is to read things 100 times, 50 times, you know, multiple times. So rather than reading many books, that's my target. I just said that, I just felt that was possible. Am I making sense? Yes. You know, you know, I, I, I honestly don't know how we could have brought you this quality man of God and some people will not be here. And then the goal is to prepare you. And God, we spend the time praying to the Lord to give us uh, resource people. And God has sent us quality resource people. And then people are seated in their home. I mean, hear this. Do you understand? Hear what is going on here. Daughter, this is what happened. I could have answered that question, but thank you, Pastor, uh, for that answer. He said, and of course, that wasn't the first time I was hearing that, but it was just reaffirming. He said, a lizard in Nigeria cannot change and become a lion in America. A lizard will always be a lizard. Does that make sense? If you are going to change from who you are today to who you want to be tomorrow, you're going to look at who is this person, not, and then who is this, what does this person need to become this person? Does that make sense? And then you will increase your capacity. Today, you only read one book a week, a month, a year, but you want to be like Pastor Ola the Book of Clement, then he's been sharing his mind with us. And by the grace of God, we have his book, so we know who this guy is. When we read this book and fellowship with his book, we are fellowship with him, even though he's not physically present. We can, you see, one wise man says, the secret of great men is in their stories. Do you understand it? Reverend Samadhi, and he said, for many years, he tried to reach Bishop David Oedipo and never had the opportunity to see him one time. And yet, he's a spiritual father. He said he never. He said one day they told him that Bishop was traveling and was going to go through the airport. And so he ran to the airport. When he got to the airport, he was waiting. Now, he's today, I will see the Dr. Edepo. He's today, I will see Dr. Edepo. Oh, Edepo passed and went to. Didn't know that somebody Ebi was waiting for him. And then he said, he, Reverend Sam said he came back home. And what did he do? He said, I went and bought all of his book. If I cannot see you. Your thought, your mind, they are, is in your book. He said he started reading all these books. 
Today, if Reverend Sam wants to see the bishop this morning, I said, Bishop, he's uh, not in the country. You'll go and see him. And Reverend Sam at the enemy has resort. So, we, I can change. I can, from who I am today to who I want to be, if I look at the people and there is no height you want to attain, that people are not there yet, all you have to do is find the right people who are there and ask your question or, you know, get to know how they got there and do what they did. Praise the Lord. What is the time? Praise the Lord. Um, you raise your hand. We're going to keep your questions. Uh, he, ha he, he has to be... <laughs> We're going to make tomorrow, we're going to adjust this tomorrow to the extent that he will take question in the service. Okay, we'll take question. Let's ask uh, Sister Damilola, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, sir, please, can you just quickly um, explain the difference between that financial independence and financial freedom? And this um, circle of people again. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the financial independence is more about you. So it's a point in your life where the proceed from your assets and investments. You know, um, part of the things that will show that you are truly financially intelligent is your understanding of the difference between assets and liabilities. Assets appreciate in value and then they put money in your pocket. Liability, on the other hand, depreciates in value and takes money away from you. Um, so we are all making money. But what we use our money to do differ from person to person, and it's your level of financial intelligence. So financial independence is that point when the proceed from those assets is capable of meeting your personal family. So if, for example, a year you earn two hundred or five hundred thousand dollars a year, and then you stacked up assets, you built your, you you furnished your asset column to a level where the passive income, the the rental income you generate from those assets is up to 500,000 or even more than 500,000. It can be regarded as financially free because uh, what I, in, in the book, I also give you how to calculate, how to measure, how to set targets for your financial independence. So there's a formula for measuring, there's a rule 24, there's a rule 72, there's a rule 20. There are different rules. These things is templatized. Something that that's, there's a science to the result you want to see. Yes, and I also shared in that book um, my financial freedom templates that anybody can uh, pick and modify for their own personal use. Uh, so financial, so that one is for personal or family needs. So the proceeds can meet your personal and family needs. But financial freedom is when the proceeds um, from your assets and investments is not only able to take care of your family and personal and family needs, but also able to extend goodness and kindness to others. You see, one is not just about me, myself and I, it's also about others. And I said that's the source of true fulfillment. And the truth is that you don't need to get there before you start doing that. Mm. It's also one of the ways by which we accelerate our progress. Um, and then for this, I mentioned that the circle of relationships is in three circles. I mean, your relationship is in three circles. Holy place, or most, most holy place of holies of holies, like we call it in the temple, uh, where the priest goes to meet with God and they tie a rope around his waist and then so that in case the guy is struck down <laughs> they can have something to pull him out you know and that's the that's the deepest part of your life and I said inner circle even Jesus had that inner circle he had a one a beloved John beloved he had a three and then he had twelve right and then he had seventy he had five hundred one twenty he had 500 and on and on. So what we must do and ensure, because it takes time, it takes a lot of resources to, to nurture relationships, right? It takes time, it takes energy, it takes a lot to nurture relationships. So you, you, you don't, you can't have everybody in that circle. So uh, you have to be sensitive, you have to pray. Uh, I'm sure I mean, pastor, pastor teachers and all of that. I, and this is what we're going to do, Pastor. Thank you so much. I apologize that I'm not taking the questions for people raising their hand uh, with him. But we're going to have this break. You can ask your question. I'm not Pastor Ladi Kupo, but I can tell you that by the grace of God, I'll be able to try to answer this question. But you can also write it down 
and tomorrow after you finish ministry or teaching then we are going to have q a tomorrow we'll still close at the right time at this point i'm going to ask uh deacon you to please help us and deacon because please help us move a pastor to the conference room in the in the office area um uh, i think the key you know do you have, we need the key maybe it's in my car but ladies uh brethren please would you can ask your question but here is what i want to say your questions can will be answered uh, is that okay but if you are if you rather have pastor that will answer your question that is perfectly fine we will you should just write it down and then tomorrow we'll take as many as we can take it's not going to be a regular service like uh, preach and pray and go uh, we'll let him talk then we'll ask question but if you want to ask a question that's okay why we're doing that we will uh in Yerua, please go help me give them the key to the conference room you already did god bless you why we're doing that anybody please let us not go in front of the camera anymore because these guys are recording why we're doing that before our next speaker will come if you want to grab coffee at the back or snack or whatever okay eh? sandwich they have so you say they have sandwich you can take two three minutes to eat sandwich and then we we'll start the next class now what is your question if you are comfortable asking your question jesus had judas iscariot yeah so i'll be anything here yeah i was going to say he also like <laughs> yeah, like someone addition take the microphone at the back huh? he said jesus had judas iscariot in his inner circle but it's not judas was not here though He was a disciple. So, what's your question? He was betrayed by Judas, and Judas was one of the disciples who had bad people in the inner I'm sorry? Even Jesus had bad people. Yes, that's correct. Your answer is even Jesus had bad people. Yes, I was thinking. Betrayal like that. So, how do you do with betrayal like that? Because you don't know everybody you have in your inner circle. You don't know what they are thinking. Yeah. If somebody betrays you, how do you like it? Do you know that what we call the betrayal by Judas was actually to help Jesus fulfill his purpose, his mission? Somebody, the betrayal of Joseph by his brothers was to help Joseph fulfill God's purpose for his life. Does that make sense? So if somebody is your inner circle, your friend that you really like, wow, my sister, my friend, my inner circle, and they betray you, glory to God, they are moving you closer to the plan and purpose of God for your life. Without Judas, Jesus probably, well, I shouldn't say that, without Judas, maybe another person would have played that role, but Jesus primary reason, only reason for coming to, uh, as a man, right it was for him to come and die and resurrect and save you and i somebody had to play that role and it was judas somebody was and it has to be somebody closer to him does that make sense why it has to be somebody who knows him who will be able to say that's her that's him without any doubt does that make sense that's why judas played that role so how do you deal with betrayers uh, it's not a big deal. If somebody has betrayed you, they are moving you closer to God's purpose for your life. You don't have to become who you are not because somebody betrayed you. Don't allow betrayer to change you who you are. Don't become bitter because somebody has betrayed you. No. Now, wisdom dictates that you can keep a betrayer at harm. You should keep a betrayer at harm's length. You know, you know what that means. You know, that's an accounting term, harm's length. You keep them, ah, uh, okay. Does that make sense? You're not fighting, you're protecting yourself. Does that make sense? But don't become a betrayer because somebody has betrayed you. Praise the Lord. Okay? Let's, let's, uh, you can stop the recording. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you. Let's clap for our media and IT. They do a fantastic job. Thank you, thank you. So, let's grab water, let's grab coffee, let's grab whatever you want to grab, and then we'll be ready by 12 o'clock.
I guess it's not everybody. I was very, very blessed. Amen. All right. This is the final session for today. And what we are, we are very, very blessed to have uh, Dr. Labo. Man, everybody said, bring God in our life. Hallelujah. I wish uh, we were going to look in at this time. His health matters. You know, it's very important. If you are very wealthy, I mean, Pastor Radio just told us that after, uh, what was the first one now? Faith, then it's fitness. We know that, right? Uh, no matter how much money you have in your hand, if you are not healthy, you are just deceiving yourself. And uh, we know that in this country or and anywhere, any country, uh, sickness is not good. And people are just one sickness away from bankruptcy. Just one sickness, you know. People could have saved ten million dollars. I told you that the first bill they gave me last year, two thousand and one. Sorry, it was two thousand twenty one. It was over three hundred thousand dollars. How much could I have saved when they brought the bill? Three hundred thousand dollars. I'm looking at it. Well, where would I have seen that? So. Meanwhile, there are little, little things we can do that can help us. So we are here to be blessed in this session by uh, Dr. Labo, who's going to teach us uh, on health matters. So let us clap for Jesus as we receive her. God bless you. Let's, and let's keep clapping for her. Hallelujah. Amen. Clap, 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 clap. Amen. Good morning, family. Um, I'm so blessed to be here. It's really an honor. Thank you, Pastor, for giving me this opportunity to do this. <laughs> I'm usually, I'm usually like backbencher, background person. So this is really out of now for me. Uh, let us just pray. It's a short prayer. Father Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for giving us this chance to. Do hear this talk about help. You are the great physician and oh Lord God Almighty, this talk is not to create fear in people, but for us to be empowered and to know how to cherish these beautiful bodies that you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. So, um, I think it was in December, Pastor said, hey, will you be able to talk about health matters? And is it's a very generalized and large topic because it's all around. And I'm a pediatrician, so if you think of life from 0 to 21, those are the people I deal with on a regular basis. I don't like big people. <laughs> so uh, with this, I will be extending my knowledge a bit to the adult world. And uh, I have some dry dad jokes, so bear with me. Um, so in pediatrics anyway, preventive care is very common. You take your kids in very frequently to the doctor's office between the first to four years of age and then it becomes less frequent and becomes yearly. And unfortunately, as we become adults, that drops down because you're busy, you think health is nothing, you're strong, you're young, and all the good stuff. So. Um, we do not keep up with our he um, healthy annual checkups, and that becomes a problem. I like to define words. So going on to the next slides, please. Um, we're talking about health, and health can be simply defined as the state of being free from illness or injury. Mm. That is just putting it very simple. Um, so if you feel like you're healthy, you're, you don't feel sick, and you know the difference when you have a headache for two days and then you're headache free, you're like, oof, yeah. I like this. Um, WHO, which is the World Health Organization, which is like the policeman and everything to health care to the entire world, says that health is a state of complete. I made that bold and um, it's a lie. It's because complete is very deep and difficult to attain. 
but is the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So when you think of it that way, it's not just what is happening to your body as we know it. And if we remember, we're not just flesh, we're body, mind, spirit, and all the good stuff. So it's the complete, complete well-being of that. Next slide, please. So when that is said that is the absence of disease, what is the meaning of disease? It is a disorder of structure or function in a human, animal, or plant. Mm -hmm. So an animal, for people that have pets, you know, you take them to the vets, they get sick, we get sick. So uh, with disease, especially the one that has a known cause or a distinctive group of symptoms, that is what you see, like a person has a fever, signs what your doctors see when they examine you, and any anatomical changes, which can be from like a fracture, because it's obvious that the anatomy, if your arm is supposed to be straight, all of a sudden you have a fracture and it's crooked and has to be put in a cast. Some people define it as four types. Uh, the infectious diseases, that is usually from a virus or a bacteria infection. Um, deficiencies, when you do not have certain vital parts of your functioning, can be from vitamins to the enzymes in the body that makes our body function normally. Um, hereditary, we could be genetic or non-genetic. And I was like, how can I explain that? Because I was like, hmm, it's actually something that you inherit from your parents mm -hmm. and it can be from your genes because we, our whole being is all genes mm -hmm. and it can be non-genetic and that could be from an environmental stuff. Uh, recently, I was reading something about um, the lights for ladies that do pedicure, the lights that they use yeah. for your gel yeah. thing, that it can change your DNA. So that would be a non-genetic cause of abnormality. And then it can be physiological, that is like, if your body is supposed to go A, B, C, it decides to go B, C, D, you know, it's out of work. So that would be physiological. Next slide, please. So well-being, WHO talks about the complete well-being. Is this a feasible thing in life for us? Like um, being an adult is very interesting. I, I have um, a little plaque at home, like I switch it, I'll say, nope, not today. I don't want to be an adult and today I, I'm adulting today. So it, I have my days that, you know, you want to stay in bed, you feel like being a child with no worries in life, but it's not so. Um, well-being can be simply defined as judging life positively and feeling good. Mm. And that is true. If you have something wrong with your body, you just do not feel good, you feel horrible. Um, it's also considered or defined as a state of being comfortable, healthy, and happy. And we know that happiness is usually dictated by the surroundings, your um, your, the happenings around you, which is different from joy. Next slide, please. So, um, wellness, which is part of well-being, has a holistic integration of the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. So whatever we do, we cannot get away from the spirit man. And actually, that is what sustains us to survive our day-to-day. It means fueling your body. How do you do that? You eat, you drink, and you provide the energies and the source of fuel for your body. It means engaging your mind, because they say the mind is a terrible thing to waste. Um, if you, and there's another one, um, is it the idle mind is the playground for the, yeah, yeah. So, the mind has to be engaged, and this is where, as Christians, you know how to engage your mind. And the world knows how to engage your minds, because if you are aware of what is happening in schools, they have mindfulness exercises. They, they put stuff that comes into the life of our children and changes their mind. Then it's a way to nurture the spirit. Being in the Lord, you know, nurturing your spirit means being in the Word. That's the only way. The Bible says renew your mind. 
that's the only way you can nurture your spirit. Prayers, reading the word, spending time with God, hearing from him and all that. There are seven um, steps or stages of types of being in well-being. We've talked about mental, which is really under attack, attack nowadays. Um, mental health is real and it's happening and it's getting worse and we have less providers for it. We have the physical, social, financial, spiritual, environmental and vocational. These are interdependent of each other and kind of influence each other. And I have some examples and I'm sure you can think of some um, over there. Um, for example, if you're poor, the chances of you having a poor diet and affecting your physical being. So financial is affecting physical in that case. Um, if you have mental health issues, your insight to things around you is all different. Um, you're unaware of good physical care. It affects your physical being, so you will not take your medications. If you have medications, you will not take care of yourself. You want to just stay in bed and gain weight and not do anything. Um, so that is where mental will affect your physical well-being. And of course, with that, it can affect education and poor education leads to poor financial future. Um, whether we like it or not, is education is still part of what steps you out of um, um, poverty. Um, the environment, if you live in a place that is filthy, if your house has mold, if you live in a community with industries that are mean and not being careful, just putting all the toxic into the atmosphere, that will affect your physical well-being. Um, your job also dictates your well-being. If you're working around the clock without taking care of your physical well-being, if you're stressed, if your home is unhappy. So, so many things in this health and well-being, they all interwine and um, play, have a play together. Next step. Next slide. Is that the next one? No. I think it's not there. Yeah, it's already there. Oh, it moved. Okay, basics. So, I wanted to talk a little bit about the basic stuff. And um, before I go on to the basics, um, Pastor already mentioned it. I, I did my residency in New York City. That is a city where you have a close interaction with Jews if you love Jews. And as Christians, I really love Jews because these are people that God called and said, I love you, I bless you. It's like, why did you come to Africa and do that? <laughs> so it's like, so you have in New York, you must have a Jewish lawyer, a Jewish doctor, and you are well. So I love them very much. And one of my attendants, uh, those are the, the you know, people that train us, um, he's a Jew. And he said, um, well, he can be very wealthy. We know the Jews are very wealthy. But it doesn't make sense if you're not healthy. Um, because if you're unhealthy, you spend all your money trying to get healthy, or you won't even have the energy to use your wealth. So it's like health is wealth. You know, they say that health is wealth. And it's really true. So that's the example of that. It's sad and deep, but very true. So going on to basics. Um, before we go into oh, go to the doctor, what are the things that we can do to make us feel better? Sleep. Very important. Very important. Um, if you do not sleep, you cannot function. If you're a child and you do not sleep, you try and keep yourself awake, and then they tell you or label you as being hyperactive in school, because a child is feeling sleepy in school, they know that I'm not supposed to sleep in school. How do I keep awake? Let me go pinch my neighbor. Let me do this. Then the teacher will go, hmm, they are hyperactive. An adult, if you don't sleep, you can't focus at work. You are cranky at home. You are not the best. It affects our hormones. We gain weight. We not healthy. Your blood pressure is high. Your glucose may be high. And it's just not the best. The Lord says, He giveth a beloved sleep. 
It's a wonderful thing to sleep. People make fun of me, I can sleep anywhere. I have been in rounds and I've fallen asleep. Standing up, I've just been on the wall and sleep. So God has blessed me with that. Um, diet is also something that is important. It's very, very hard. Growing up, most of us grew up in Africa. I cannot remember eating a meal in the vehicle. In America, you feed your kids. I remember how I used to drive and pass a fry to my daughter in the back. Drive with one hand, use your right hand. Hey, don't choke, let's go. So, you're just on the go. Diet is very important. I grew up in a home where my mom would never let us leave without having breakfast. So, she, she will say, eat breakfast. So, we had that time to eat breakfast. It's still something I enjoy doing. I skip a lot of breakfast. Um, by grabbing on the road, and she's always making fun of me that you're always buying food. I'm like, mm, what can I do? So diet is very important. Those are the little things we can do. Hydration is also important. If you're on the go, go, go. Life is so good. You have all kind of water bottles. Go wild, find water bottles, and take it along with you and drink. Very important to be hydrated. Balance is work life balance. We older people, we don't have that. The younger kids, they're like, my life first, work later. They don't play. But we are like, and it's because of how we grew up. I cannot remember all my life. I remember my dad stepping out of the house at 6.30 a.m. every day, Monday to Friday. He was out to work. So it was very odd for me to see grown people sitting in front of their houses when we came to the U.S. But balance is very important. Balance with your family, your work, your play life. We do not enjoy ourselves. We do not know how to relax. We do not know how to just sit down and do nothing like the um, vegetable people. They sit around and do nothing. <laughs> so, yes, that's very important. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this is very busy. So now we're going to go to pediatrics. And basically, child health care varies from place to place. Most places can go up to the age of 21. Some people are like teenagers, you're done, you have adult problems as a teen. Um, they, they don't deal with you. Um, so it's from 0 to 21. It's a very, very great specialty. I love it because every phase of development in a child is different. And that is what a lot of people do not understand with what we do, uh, but it is fun. It is very simple to keep your child healthy with your followers if you have a good pediatrician. You start searching for a pediatrician, even maybe, let me not be too aggressive and say maybe before you get pregnant, but once you get, when you're married, you're pregnant, start looking for a pediatrician. Go visit the offices. Some people are very hyper, they'll make phone calls and see how quick or not they answer their calls. They want to see if they have a sick or well um, side to the visit, to the office, because you have to focus on getting your child well and keeping them well. Um, so a good pediatric office will make life easy for you. You go for your two-week visit, they'll say see you in four weeks. And, and you know, you know you're going in two months to get vaccines. You're coming back in four months to get vaccines. So it's so easy and, and just so good to um, to go to your doctor's visit. I don't know if any one of us has concerns about vaccines because of what we have heard. Um, it's out there. It's scary. But one thing I, I do, and I've always done with my kids, is to pray before any vaccine is given to them because is a different thing. Um, I have an idea of what it does, and I just want to pray and make sure that it, it does their body good. It does what it's supposed to do for them. Um, so a good rapport with your pediatrician, be able to talk to your pediatrician. If you have concerns, if you see concerns, talk. I'm a very aggressive person. I like to make sure a child is school ready, uh, society ready. So if I have a child that is not talking at the age of two as a pediatrician, I'm like, no, we're good to speak therapy, we evaluate you, we make sure you're good before you get into school. Um, for many reasons, um, 
I do that especially for us colored because we have a lot to go through. Once your child is labeled in the school system, it takes a lot to shake it off. So you have to be that person to stand for your child and be the voice for your child all the time. So have someone you can trust, have someone your child can trust because as they get older, they are going to be telling the pediatrician what they feel, what is going on. And as pediatricians, we kind of put the child first and um, we listen to them. If they say, don't tell my parents, my, my way is your parents have to know, but you are going to tell your parents. And we can do that in the office with me. So you need pediatricians that can listen to you and hear your concerns about that. Development is very key. Know how your child should develop, what they should be doing at different phases of their lives, even until they're out of your home. Um, it's very important. I know that most of us might have read books, you know, the first, your first pregnancy, you're excited, you buy books about uh, what to expect when you're expecting, you read every week, you know, your peach size, your apple size, and all that stuff. Do the same for your kids. Know when they're supposed to talk. Know when it's appropriate to drop their R's and their S and know that, oh, that's fine, you'll get it. But know what is supposed to happen to your child. As your kids get older, talk to your children. Um, before coming here, I, had, I was blessed to have a flexible um, um, schedule. So the setup in our house, my husband took the kids to school and I picked them up. And I kind of had that, I detox them in the car before we get home. It's not easy to be in school from 8 to 3. And then you get in the car and your mom is like, what happened? Like, why? What? No, nothing. Mm -hmm. So you talk, you know, you talk to them, you find out stuff, you know their friends, so that when they're older, they will know that they can talk to you about anything and everything. It is a blessing to know that. I've seen kids that are so afraid to talk to their parents and then they act out by being suicidal, by wanting to harm others because they can't talk to their parents. They have that reverence for their parents, they are scared of maybe disappointing their parents, but being unable to talk to their parents hurts them more and they just feel like I have to escape from this feeling that I'm going through. So, talk to your parents is very important, different from when we were growing up. They are exposed to a lot, fast and furious. Information left, right, center coming across to them. It is not easy. And then we still have our Nigerian African mentality and we cannot understand what they are going through. It is very, very difficult for them to relate. They are Nigerians or African in our house and there are Americans outside their house. It is a very difficult double duty for a child to carry. So understand them, know what they're going through, appreciate them, make the jokes with how the cultures are. My daughter will be like, oh, somebody did that. They forgot they have African parents. She knows, but she knows that, you know, we can do stuff, we can talk, and we can go from there. So, because they see, they hear, and they absorb everything in their lives. Okay, we'll talk about children and all that. Next slide, please. So, we're going to go a little bit into adult. Um, maintenance is the way to go. I can't say much about other countries, but Nigerians, we, don't, we have a poor maintenance culture. As we see from our roads, our houses, and everything, the country is growing how many percent per year? We still have, um, where is that place in Niger State? The kind you down. Yeah. That's the only place, right? Yeah. Yeah. Providing power for a country that is growing <laughs> leaps and bounds. So maintenance is very poor, and that is what affects us as adults. And so many other things. You think you are all that invincible, I don't need any doctor to tell me anything. The worst are our men, unfortunately. My husband doesn't go anywhere. Until last year, I was, we went to a doctor. I was like, what happened? What's wrong with you? <laughs> we just hear it. I say, why don't you want to go? He said, I'm a doctor. I said, okay. It's okay. I just kept praying. 
So always have a primary care provider. Always have your doctor, someone that knows you. So therefore, like a pediatrician, you want someone you can talk to. You know, you have some people you talk to and they would just like, mm, whatever. You want a compassionate thing. Unfortunately, I will tell you, healthcare is getting more difficult. Compassion has gone out the window. But some people are still compassionate. So find that person. And then when you have your primary care fit, know what you need to do, what you need to do when you go to your doctor's office. Yearly appointment is a must. It's really something that needs to be done. But then you should not do your research that, hey, okay, I'm going to this visit, oh, I'm 22 years old, I'm 35 years old, what will the doctor do for me? What is expected? So you're not, because you don't want to, um, there are quacks out there. So you want to be knowledgeable and be able to say, ah, oh, what's my blood pressure today? Oh, we didn't take it. Ah, do you mind taking it? You know, just let them know that you're not a clueless person and do little things like that. Ask questions, write down your questions. The next thing I want to uh, remind us is know your body. Nobody can know your body better than you. You are the only person that can open uh, your eyes in the morning and say, wow, oh, I'm tired this morning. Nobody, your spouse will even know that you're exhausted. So you have to know your body, what your limitations are, what your body is to you physically. Then know your numbers. We're going to go over that a little bit. The last one is family history. Very poor with Africans. We hide our family history, medical history. So you do not know what is going on. For example, um, people dying at the age of 40 in your family. Red flag. Why? You want to know why. Someone will know in the family, so you find out. Because if it's from a sudden heart attack, be careful. You will know what to do. You will reduce all your risk factors. If you are drinking, you stop drinking. If you are smoking, you stop smoking. You do as much as possible. And you follow up with your doctor and you give that history and they know what to look for. Family history is very important. So with that being said, you are responsible to know your child's family history and hand it over to them. So that they know that at the age of two, because they won't remember, oh, I had surgery. Or at the, uh, at the age of five, um, something happened. You know, I had febrile seizure. They have their history. So when they have their children, they will know what to tell the kids. They'll be like, oh yeah, I had lots of ear infection growing up. I even had tube splits. But if you don't tell your children all those little things, they won't know. And then you let them know your own history. You have blood pressure, you have diabetes. There's no ostrich mentality in this situation. You know the ostrich, put their head there, their whole body is in the atmosphere. So if the car is going to run them down, it's going to run them down, you are, you are gone. But if you have your eyes wide open, it's, very, it's, it's just good to be knowledgeable. The Bible says, if you're not wise, ask for wisdom. So why are we trying to do... Um, I don't even know if it's a lot of my kind of situation, but being in a God forbid situation, but it's not the right way to do stuff. Next slide, please. Okay, this is why I printed those things, because it was so small. But this actually gives you an idea of when, what you do when you go visit. I'll just talk about the 20s and maybe the 40s. Okay, so in your 20s, it's like, oh, we women have a lot, right? Pastor, mommy, pastor. We have so much. <laughs> So, but in your 20s, you, you have to do your eye exam, which is good to know. For those of us that have been wearing glasses since we were five or six, it's like, it's, it's no brainer. We go to the ophthalmologist, the optician every year. But if you don't wear glasses, try and get your eyes checked. Um, so between 20 and 29, the clinical breast exam, that is something that your doctor will perform every three years, starting at the age of 20, um, a pap smear every one to three years, um, starting at the age of 21, or whenever you become sexually active, which should not be our case if we are not married, but never say never. Um, pelvic exam, yearly, yearly chlamydia test, and then whenever you have new partners, which is not something, but it's good to be knowledgeable. For the men, eye exam between the age of 20 and 29, and testicular exam, 
asking your doctor starting from the age of 18. So your doctor can perform it, and this is something you also have to do. Um, I, I know a young guy, one, one of my daughter's um, classmates in high school, found testicular cancer that way. So it's very, very interesting and important to be, and he was able to tell his mom. It was his mom he told. So um, it's very important to be able to get this done. So going into the 50s, you have the colorectal screenings. And all these screenings change so frequently because colorectal screening was at 50 and above. I think they dropped it now to 45. Uh, or even LA, if you have a strong family history, that you go again. Family history is important. If you don't know about the cancer of the colon in the family, you will just cruise until you have a stage four because you just were clueless. So family history is very important. So we all this, um, so that is done every 10 years if it is a colonoscopy and all the other things that will be done at your doctor's visit is listed down there. Some things you do not do as often, something like bone density. And I think that will vary from race because uh, that would be less for us um, African-Americans because we don't have much issue with osteoporosis versus the uh, Caucasian uh, colleagues. So that is that. Uh, so that was the small thing then and um, that was why I printed it. Next slide, please. So there are things simple things that we can do at home that will be self-screening. Um, so the first one, I have that one up there for spot the skin, uh, skin cancer. So these are things that you do at home that can expose potential problems. And you know, you find something abnormal and you'll be able to go on and tell your pediatrician, uh, not your physician, that you found something abnormal. I'm starting with the skin. It's not like the most important uh, test or screening to do, but actually the skin is said to be the largest organ of the body. So, um, so it's going to be the first one to check your skin maybe every 6 to 12 months by yourself uh, is the screening you do. When I was getting ready for this, I was trying to see because it's very hard to see every part of your body and I was laughing at the acrobatic moves that a single person has to do to with the mirror and try and look at every part of your body to look for this spot. So that's the good thing that trumps with being married. Your spouse can do that for you. Mm -hmm. So that you can get all, every part of your body checked and look for spots. Uh, we are not so prone to spots um, as um, darker colored people. And uh, what do you look out for? You look for asymmetry, the edges being um, uneven and uh, the shape being different the coloration, how large or small it is, and how it is evolving. Is it light and it starts getting dark as time goes on? Get in touch with your primary care physician. If you have insurance issues that needs referral, get referred to um, a dermatologist. Um, they talked about something else that was interesting, the stair test. Uh, next slide, please. So the stairs test is very interesting. They said go up four flights of stairs without stopping. <laughs> I was like, I have to do um, a disclaimer for this. Please, if you cannot run to your mailbox without huffing and puffing and passing out, do not do this unless you are going to do it. So, so, but I was thinking to myself, I said, this can be a gradual thing. Maybe one flight of stairs at work, you know, if you have multiple foot, just do one flight of stairs, go up, go down and go sit down. It's better than nothing. And then by the time you can do your four flights without, you know, just going up without huffing and puffing or breaking on the landings, that would be awesome. Then we have the um, BMI, which is actually something that um, measures our general health well-being. Um, it's not very accurate in older adults. I don't think it's very accurate with blacks. And I don't think, um, and it's very not accurate to muscular people because it uses weight, height, and stuff. So if you are very weighty but you have just all muscles and not really fat, it will give you a wrong um, 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 idea of how healthy you are. Um, the next best one is your waist size. And for women, they said less than 35 inches are allowed. I'm not healthy. <laughs> 
and then for men less than 40 inches. I was like, okay, I think they're talking about Barbie and Ken here. Yeah. <laughs> Not real human beings. <laughs> so, uh, so that's that's something that we blacks don't really. We're not we're not the plastic people. <laughs> so um, so that's that. Um, the heart rate also just I think this is more for you to know what is your normal heart rate. So in a healthy person, it's between sixty to hundred. If it's too low, you have a problem. It may mean that you have a block. In the heart, if it's too high, it may be an indication of something else happening. You may be anemic, you may not just be feeling well. So it's an indicator of what is right. And with the technology and all these smart wristwatches, that is an easy thing for people to measure. Now I'm going on to self-check for men. And uh, I'd like you to uh, visit the Testicular Cancer Society website. And that will give you more details how to check yourself. Um, and make sure you know, like I said, know your body. So you have to know normal before you can say, ooh, this is abnormal. So check yourself with that. And also self-check for women. I liked the For the Love of Cups um, website. It was very interesting how they, and they have videos. Um, they have videos um, for how to do this self-check so you can watch it. The life of google.com has been very interesting. Yeah. So you can do this and it's, it's very important because like if you don't know what is normal, you would be freaking out because we're all different. For women, it's, said to, it's best to check yourself the week after your period, but I usually say the last day of your period so you don't forget and you just do it normal. Uh, spouses have discovered abnormal masses in each other, so that's another good thing. Um, but it's very, very important. Um, to know that. Uh, next um, slide, please. So now we're going to knowing your numbers. The three main things that is a problem in adults is your blood sugar, your blood pressure, and cholesterol level. So blood sugar is what determines if you're diabetic or not. And then you have the hemoglobin A1C that is measured. Hemoglobin usually lives for 60 to 90 days. So it's considered a good record of how your glucose levels have been during two to three months. And um, it tells you if you're being high or low and all that. So if you're pre-diabetic, it's between 5.7% and 6.4%. So your happy number should be less than 5.7%. I don't want you to cram your heads with numbers, but just know that and good, less than 5.7. Usually this is checked yearly when you go for your yearly uh, checkup. Um, that's what happens with that. And if you're diabetic, it's more than 6.5. So many ways to control that. You can start with diet, weight loss, um, better health um, habits and stuff like that. Um, blood pressure also has ranged from what is the number to have now where Anything less than 120 over 80 is the ideal numbers to have. It has gone from 120 to 140 and 70 to 90, but now we are at 120 over 80. That's another thing, it's always changing. So that is how you keep your self knowledgeable and um, um, know what is the normal for you. Cholesterol, you have the LDL. Uh, which is the low density lipoprotein. The lipoprotein is what carries fat from one cell to the other because um, fat cannot dissolve, it's not soluble in our blood. So you have this lipoprotein. And the lipoprotein, the LDL, is the bad cholesterol and it carries, if it's high, you have a problem. Um, and the good um, cholesterol is the H which is the high density lipoprotein. Can we, uh, next slide. Okay, so the numbers for cholesterol, your total cholesterol should be less than 200, LDL should be less than 100, and HDL should be more than 60. So you want more of a good cholesterol and less of the bad cholesterol. And what do the cholesterol do? It's usually um, too much of it, of course, it lines um, the inner wall of our arteries. So 
it determines your coronary artery. The coronary artery is the artery that supplies the heart muscle itself. It, it defines uh, the health of your peripheral arteries, which is anything outside of the core of your body, your extremities. So, and then your carotid, the artery that goes to your brain. So coronary artery misbehaving, narrow because of deposit of cholesterol, heart attack. Peripheral artery, narrow because of cholesterol, um, poor wound um, healing, you will have ulcers, you will have nerve issues, and then carotid artery issues occurring with stroke. Because when that is narrow, you have poor blood supply, and then the problem with cholesterol and the plaques that it causes in arteries that it can break loose and go to the next level. So that can go cause stroke and all that. And the other thing it does, especially with the peripheral arteries, high blood pressure. Next slide, please. So I think this I did it was more colorful. We have healthy at risk and dangerous levels, but. That's just too much numbers. You want to just know that less than 200, less than 100, more than 60. Those are your numbers and you just stay with that. Don't think of extracurricular stuff. <laughs> Next uh, slide. Okay. So, they recommend activity. Uh, this is when I was writing this. I said, oh, preach to yourself, bro. <laughs> Because I, I, I have, if, if you have any excuse, I have more than you. I do not like dogs, I don't like bugs, I don't like cold, I don't like heat. Any excuse not to do anything I have. So, um, in pediatrics, it's recommended that 60 minutes a day being outdoor for children is wonderful. I was out there not too long ago and I saw them just running up and down and I was like, wow, this is what they should be doing and not be behind the screen. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually doesn't want you to have screen time for your kids less than two years of age and then they limit it to less than two hours after the age of two. That cannot happen because of the lifestyle we all have. It's like, please keep my child for 10 minutes. Please. But activity is very important and being able to play. Growing up, you played with stuff. You did stuff from nothing. Yes, you, yes you, you did stuff from nothing. So my brother and I, we used to talk like, I don't know, we used to talk in a language that we, did, we understood ourselves, but our parents didn't understand. And we, we played for hours just doing that. Um, for adults, they said 150 minutes a week. So about 30 minutes a day for five days of moderate intensity, which is brisk walking. And I think that is good for all of us. There's a high intensity, but I'm still trying to get out of the house, so moderate intensity is what I call it. <laughs> and then they recommend two days of muscle strengthening, trying to use strengthen all the major uh, muscle groups. And you can find that in Google, the details for that, and be able to do something. Um, if you don't want to go to the gym and do that, that's fine. Um, Let's see, the next slide please. Okay, so when we've done all this, you have to remember who you are in Christ. I, I really don't understand how people live life without God, but you have to remember, it's very hard, but you keep reminding yourself, I'm a child of God. Don't forget your spirit, man, which we know we're supposed to touch. Um, remember whose report you will believe. You'll get bad news. You, you, you may be told you have something. And what I just advise you is like, Lord, I know you can heal me. If you don't heal me, this thing is not gonna kill me. And that's it. Um, my mom, when she was told that she had glaucoma, which is increased pressure of the eyeballs, my mom said, I'm not gonna go blind. She uses her drug every day. She was diagnosed years ago. You just made that agreement at that point in time. It's like, I don't know about when, but I'm not going to go blind from it. So you know the complication of whatever they give you. They, when they tell yourself in the doctor's office, if your doctor is a believer, you say, ah, no, that is not my portion and all that. But that doesn't mean that they give you medicine and you go and put it under your pillow. No. Take your medicine, keep praying, believe in God, and know all the side effects 
of your medications, all the side effects of the disease, and said, this is not going to happen to me. Um, so being knowledgeable is so that you do not live in fear, but you know how to pray. You pray for healing. You pray for no complications. You pray for wisdom. Because sometimes, okay, uh, Pastor, I will use your own example. When he had the little tickle in his chest, he could have disobeyed that little voice that said, go to the ED. You know, because you know, just shake it up. Oh, it's just a little thing. Well, he went to the ED. So learn to trust God and pray that you will hear from him. Because you may just feel funny one day and you'll be like, go to the ED, go to the ED. Or go and see your doctor and it will be something. But then when you're told something, knowledgeable, all the medications you take, know the side effects. So that if something happens, you'll be like, is it the medicine? Let your doctor know. Don't live in ignorance. It is not of God, as we say. <coughs> Next slide. So I just had those. Uh, I'm not very good at typing, so I couldn't type each one. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's it for now. Why did I say that? Our health is number one. Thank you, daughter. You know, our health is number one. Praise the Lord. Um, we need more help at the back there. Brother Corey Day is going up and down. If you want to serve, thank God. I think Brother Tola has joined them. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Come on now. Praise the Lord. Let's celebrate Jesus in the life of Dr. Labo. Amen. Praise the Lord. Again, hear me clearly, brethren. This is the most important session in this conference or in any conference. Our health is number one. You have to believe me. Your health is number one. It is health that you have that will make you go to work on Monday. A sick person cannot go to work. Hmm? It is because you are healthy. That's why as a single guy, you are thinking about marriage. I'm telling you the truth. In fact, it is because you are healthy, you are thinking about buying a new home. There is a new subdivision in your area. There is a new subdivision in whatever. It's because you are healthy. If you are not healthy, God forbid, your mind is going to be saying, okay, when you buy this house, who is going to inherit it? <laughs> That's it. The monies you have in your bank, if you are not healthy, you are thinking, what's going to happen to that? Health, we are told, is wealth. Uh, we're going to open this up for questions, but I hope that you guys appreciate what the church has done this weekend, since Wednesday till today and tomorrow. You know, this doesn't come cheap. If you, have, if you were to pay for this conference, you, you know, you pay some money. You can't get a, a physician to come talk to you. Uh, and because she's a member of our church, we're enjoying all of this. You can't get uh, all these people to come talk to us. Brother Tosi, if you get there, uh, one SVP somewhere to come talk to you, you are going to have to do something. Uh, uh, so, but let's ask our questions. What questions? And your questions can be any question in health matters. Let's take your daughter first, uh, Dr. Abi. Go ahead and ask a question. You can come and take this and be passing it around. Okay. Okay, so my question is um, so I'm the type of person that in science classes or like anything else, you're talking about like diseases and stuff, and like the symptoms I'm thinking in my head, like, oh my god, I have a headache. Or, oh my god, I actually have that too. Do I have this disease or something? So how do you avoid being so paranoid and actually be um, so watchful for like those signs instead of you just being like, oh, do I have every disease in this whole world? And yeah, there is no disease I've not experienced. That is very normal. In med school, we are having all the symptoms that we read about and we learn about every week. So you have a heart attack one day, you have diarrhea the next, everything they were teaching us we were having. So it's not unusual, it's the mind, that's why they said the mind is very powerful. 
um, you think it, you have it. But like you said, not being paranoid. That's where you as a Christian, you pray about it, you'll be like, this is not real. And you go to sleep and you wake up and you don't have it anymore. It's very normal. Everybody in med school, we went through that. Maybe yes, yeah. really, doctor, let me say something. So thank you, ma'am, for that. So when I had the surgery, one of the questions they were asking me that, you know, your people were asking me, your doctors, uh, when I got to the ER, they asked me, do you have a headache? No. Uh, for the past two weeks, how have you felt? I said, no, ma. Uh, what did you do today? I preached. What did, they asked me, I mean, just think about the question they asked me. They were trying to figure out what was going on with me. Remember, I got there 7.30 on the door in the evening. They, didn't, they couldn't figure out what was going on with me until about 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. the next day. Praise the Lord. Are they planning the coup? <laughs> Don't worry, we'll soon be out of here. One of the things they told me was, the, one of the questions they asked was, do you have headache? I said, no. So I, so when I asked the doctor, I said, what is the correlate, what's the relationship between headache and what you said was happening to me? Heart attack, I said, I didn't have heart attack. They, they did all the blood work, they said there was no symptom of heart attack. Or, they said, well, one of the symptoms of heart attack is headache. This is where the paranoia or paranoia comes into the picture. Now, if I have, <laughs> there will be such a pastor and I'll be lying. If I have a slight, and I don't usually have headache. If I have a slight anything here, now nah, I'm checking. Hey, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I have, I have scripture that I read to myself. I've read it twice this morning. I have declarations that I made when I have this kind of feeling. Like, you know, okay, my chest is behaving somehow, but when I sleep, I drink water. I am fine. I am fine. So we don't we say no to disease in Jesus' name. Amen. In the days of um, Kenneth Hagen, yes. the faith man, he will be that part of his body that oh pain, no, 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 go, go, go. I have prayed this and it's not part of my body anymore. So serious praying and being serious, but not in paranoid. If it persists, and like what Pastor said, if you go to bed, you wake up, you you're fine. Just pray, take a nap, and go. Why, man? I just, I want to say thank you, Dr. Yes, uh, uh, I want to say thank you for being a pediatrician. <laughs> uh, I want to say, pediatricians have saved my life. Mm. Um, and I have two quick examples. And I say that not to say, talk about it, but to say that so that parents of younger children can, can be more sensitive. Um, my daughter uh, kept having ear infections. And they would give her antibiotics. And they said, oh, it's because she's in daycare. Which sometimes people say that, it's because she's in daycare. And they kept giving her antibiotics every month. And I said to the doctor, also telling you the importance of being a partnership with your pediatrician. I said to the doctor, something is not right here. Give us a referral to EMT doctor. The same week, we went to a doctor and on Wednesday and on Friday, she was in the theater getting ear tubes put in. She, she was partially becoming deaf. Uh, and she was shed ear tubes. Now I say that because while they were doing the ear tube surgery and they just were like, okay, her umbilical cord, while we have her under, she was under two. While we have her under, let's just go ahead and get, get rid of this umbilical cord. They found cysts and they went ahead. So I'm talking about the fact that a child that is under two had multiple surgeries under two. And that all began from being a parent that was like, ah, this one not sound right. I'm not a doctor, I mean, then, uh, I would not have a medical doctor, but it, it was very important to be very sensitive to that. The, the other story I wanted to quickly share, the importance of being in collaboration with your doctor, uh, is, 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 my, is my son. 
We kept going to Children's Memorial in Chicago, what's going on, what's going on, before they diagnosed him with asthma. And it took being a parent that was just very intentional about, nah, this all this wheezing thing, there's, there has to be more to it. And ended up in a, a, a household where every morning had a breathing treatment before he went to school. I say that for parents, and that's why my passion is for children. I say that for parents with younger children to be more intentional about what you see, what doesn't, what seems off. Uh, and, and even when the doctors tell you it's just an infection, and because the child is in daycare, you know, we hear all these stories. If you need to push further, please push further yes. until you can get to the point where you know exactly what is going on. So I say that to say thank you so much for, for what you do as a pediatrician uh, uh, and, and for, for the lives that you're touching. And for even agreeing to come to Northwest Arkansas. Okay. Because I remember Arkansas Children's Hospital used to be in Little Rock and they used to airlift kids to Little Rock. Yes. And now we have one here in Springdale. And you were, were one of the founding staff of that hospital and the lives that you have touched in this region. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and going on that, um, a good pediatrician, usually they make fun of us or they tease us that how many patients do you have? Um, if you are not a good pediatrician, you'll say one. The answer should be two or three, depending on if both parents are in the room with the parent, uh, child. Um, we are also taught that the parents know their kids more than we seeing the child for a few minutes. So listen and be persistent. The, the lady that was bugging that judge, that judge said, oh yeah, just go, take. Yeah. The doctor would be like, hey, you want ENT, bye, go. So be persistent. You are the voice of your child all the time. Thank you, Doc. Uh, yes. This has really been a lightning seminar. I really appreciate uh, the wealth of knowledge. My question has to do with uh, medication. Uh, you scratched briefly on the vaccination and the controversy and all the uh, nuances that surround that. And at the same time, um, just from our background, and some of us have a reservation about when your child is hyperactive, what is the DND and uh, the medication that goes with it. And I guess the concern is just the side effect that you don't know if you start medicating your young child now, what the end result will be. So what are your take on this and how to when we draw the balance and uh, how do we address this? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so that was why I talked about sleep because I know that and I also talk about the fact that you know your child more than anybody and you try to avoid the labels. But also if there is real ADHD and the treatment is real, that child will love you forever. Mm. ADHD, one of my patients said, my brain feels scrambled. They just, so that, when that child told me, I learned a lot from children because like when you talk to them, they tell you, they, they don't sugarcoat stuff. They, they tell you what, that my brain just feels crumbled. When they have true ADHD, not because I'm being mischievous or all that. And that's one thing you should do. And that's one thing your good pediatrician will be able to decipher for you that is this real, is this not. But if they have real one, you get the real medication and they are fine. There are side effects. The most common is uh, appetite suppressant and not being able to sleep. That's why most of the medications is early in the morning. You just don't give a child like the medication like 10 or 11 o'clock, you're gonna mess up their sleep. So by the time it's after school, they is already wearing out of their body and you teach the parents the trick. It suppresses their appetite, but they have the appetite before they take the medicine they don't eat much in school. Before bed, they eat everything. So give them everything they want to eat at nighttime, early morning, and deal with that. So you prevent the weight loss. You help them with that. You help them with sleep. Anything you can help to make them go to bed, 
and not change their sleep habit because if bed is 8 o'clock, keep it at 8 o'clock. Don't say because it's still awake. Go lie down in bed, listen to music, nice quiet music, and just fall asleep. But if you have real and true ADHD, the medications are good. Vaccination? No, and, and medication, sorry. No, I said one about the vaccination. Vaccination is controversial. Um, there's nothing, um, like I said, Google can be our friend and it can be our enemies. A lot of we doctors, we don't like Google because people read something and they're scared and you spend so much time trying to detox them from what they read and, and trying not to look stupid before them. But there's so many things out there. But also, I listen to the parent. I cannot help with a personal fear that they have. I can tell you what I know and understand. I, as a person, I feel that there's no smoke without fire. If there's someone talking about this, whether it's for good or for evil, why did it just pop up? Um, initially, when vaccines were being made, the preventive stuff had mercury, which was scary and all that. And that is why I pray over my, vac my kids when they get their vaccines. Every vaccine, I just pray over it. I don't know, some kids get um, the tetanus, they have seizures, some kids do not have seizures, some kids have very high fever, everybody reacts to this. The goal of a vaccine is just to boost your immunity, and we all do that differently. Um, be at peace with yourself, pray over it, and get the vaccine. Because even the children get all the numerous vaccines, then the other side of life from age 50, and if you have any comorbidity, you start getting vaccines again. So it's like you can't escape. So you just pray and you go. The only thing I'm afraid of with vaccine is the needle. That is a true fear. I don't like needles. So, but otherwise, I just pray and I get it. Questions? Okay. Just ask each other. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much, Doctor Milano. Uh, also, I want to appreciate Doctor Benga. He's not here now. Uh, you're the two uh, African Americans I know of that have been helping families here. You know, I think we also need to know our body. I was strong like two weeks back. I walked into an urgent care and we did tests and they were asking me questions based on COVID. I'm like, I don't have COVID. And the nurse said, yes, based on the answers I've given to her, she doesn't think I have COVID. And the doctor came in, he's like, when you do a COVID, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing a COVID test. I don't have COVID. And he was about to start arguing. I'm like, you know what? He said, since I don't want to take COVID tests, he cannot recommend any treatment to me. And I told him, that is perfectly okay. The way I walked here with my legs is the same way you can see me walk out. And I walked out. And after three days, I shook off whatever. I shook it off. You know, many times it's happened in our life, doctors have recommended medication to our kids, and I check it online. And I see it has so many adverse adverse effects. And I tell my wife, we're not giving it to the kid. And at times we escalate, and Dr. O will tell us, why did they recommend this medication? It's too harsh. And he recommends a milder medication. So what I'm saying in essence is this, let's not be yes, yes sir parents. Don't be yes, yes sir parents. Ask questions. Research these things too on your own. You know your body. You know your children better than the doctors. And push back if you need to push back. Praise God. But Dickie, let me just let you know that being tested for COVID doesn't mean that you have COVID. You know COVID is from your asymptomatic to your dead. Mm -hmm. That's COVID. Yep. It's doing all sort of funny stuff. I remember when it was still raging and it was horrible. And that was why I stayed out of here because I was like in the forefront all the time. Um, this child came in almost gone from vomiting and diarrhea. And I was asking questions, anybody sick at home, blah, 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 blah. They said they were not sick. But apparently when the test came back positive for COVID, the parents were like, eh, we didn't know COVID causes vomiting and diarrhea. I'm like, seriously? Seriously? The virus that can cause anything like from 
they are happy jumping ropes to they are in the grave. So there's nothing, it's still an ongoing thing. So for them to check for you, it's just for your well-being, it's not to label you, so don't get upset with them. Um, but I agree with the um, medications and your children. Um, but also, I don't want us to be in denial. We, like I said, you have to read the side effect of stuff. But well, if it's your primary care physician, go back to them and say, I have, me, I listen. I have concerns about this medication. What else can we use? So, because that rapport, you have to keep it with them so that they can always have your child's interest number one because when they feel like you're antagonizing them, they will shut you down. And that is, and they do that faster for us than others. They will shut you down and you will not hear, you won't get stuff done. Even now when things are now genuine. So always just, yes, go back to them and say, hey, I read this, I have concerns, and they'll be like, because like, for example, uh, for me, parents would say, oh, which one is better, Tylenol or Ibu ibuprofen? I said, look, you have two children right now in front of you. Everybody acts different. This one may be a Tylenol baby, this one may be a Motrin baby. I cannot tell you which one is better because we all metabolize our medications differently because that is also important. So my thing is, if it's like a long-standing medication like the ADHD medications, you can study it, watch your child. If your child is doing other stuff, bring it across and say, hey, this is happening. And they'll be like, oh, maybe it's too high. Because sometimes your ADHD medicine, if it's high, you have a zombie. Mm -hmm. Your child is just like, yeah. mm -hmm. so you have to advocate. But at least try it. But I love that you um, armed yourself with knowledge and you went with that. And that's why I said know the side effect of medicine because if you give something and the child is doing this, okay, for example, Benadryl, to help you sleep or itching, to stop itching. Some kids get it and they're jumping on the roof. Yeah, so I cannot tell who will do that, but you as a parent, you give it and your child is on the roof, you'll be like, doctor, I'm not doing Benadryl again. And I will say, I agree with you. So. Yeah, don't let them shut you down. That's what I don't want for them to do to you. Oh. Sorry, I need to get on my soapbox. <laughs> so for those of us who uh, have parents that have since gone home at this point, uh, and sometimes we don't know all their medical history. Uh, what are some of the, so this is twofold, what are some of the uh, things that we need to start to pay, just generally go check out about ourselves so that uh, that way we're armed with knowledge. And I say that because, <laughs> and a lot of years ago, my dad just out of the blue just said, oh, I have a heart condition. <laughs> and all the children were home with, you know, having a nice time in Nigeria. And it was like, oh, just so you know, I have a heart condition. And everybody went quiet. And as it started to unfold, it was something that was genetic. And so he just started, oh, he said, yeah, and then his mom passed from heart disease and, you know, whatever. But I think it's very important that we're armed with that knowledge. Uh, uh, so what should we do? That's number one. Number two, let me get in my soapbox. Men, get yourself, black men, too many of y'all are dying from prostate cancer. Get yourself checked. I know old men say they don't want anybody to mess with down there. And that's always their excuse. Uh, but, I've become on that soapbox because my brother, my older brother, two years ago, three years ago now, February 2020, 61 year old guy died from prostate cancer. And from that time till now, I'm on that soapbox and I'll always be on that soapbox. Men, get yourself checked. Women, do the mammogram, do the pap smear. I know it's inconvenient, somebody is all over you doing whatever. But I think it's very important. But the, the first question is one I really want you to answer. The other one is just uh, 
my soapbox. It would be very hard because like um, for us now is our own um, responsibility to keep the history, your own history and the, your children's history. If you have your parents still alive, then um, ask them what is going on with them. Um, in regards to just having a cardiac, if it's congenital, um, I don't know exactly what was going on with Papa, but it could be just a one-time thing and not going to follow, but what happened to your grandma could be, is it a coronary artery stuff? So that would be checking your cholesterol, making sure your blood pressure is good, and things like that. It's just very hard, but from our generation, we are able to start keeping our own medical history and helping our kids to know that. I was even, when I was preparing this, I said, I have to have a binder so I can keep it and give it to my daughter so she knows um, because um, it's, it's very important, especially something like breast cancer. Um, if you go and do the genotyping and you have those genes that will give you breast cancer, ovarian, endo endometrial cancer, and you want to take everything out, you are able to do it. But you have to have that knowledge that is running in the family. I, I think maybe you, know, you can ask the one who like as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I can also add to that that, you know, my mom is still alive. Um, I know she doesn't have any disease. It's very interesting that 80 over 80. Uh, oh, yeah. She, she, has, she says, uh, I have uh, in our language, uh, they call it that, which is uh, arthritis. Uh -huh. uh, I was like, Mama, shh. You've been sitting down for 20 years. What do you do? What do you expect? Uh, but she doesn't have uh, disease. Uh, but my dad, just like uh, you know, I can. I, I I did not. My dad never discussed his hurt. His uh, not had uh, medical issues with us. Never. Uh, but hindsight, from me as a little kid being around at home hearing some conversations and then having one plus one I can put together even though I cannot I don't have the evidence beyond the discussions I heard not like I have a medical report but I can put together that this guy went through this type of conditions okay and when my brother passed away uh, in, in June of uh, 2021 uh, you know I also struggled a lot to find out why did this guy die uh, how sorry how he died in a wreck in a car wreck he was driving he was the one driving three people in the vehicle he was the only one who died and uh, very devastating period uh, for me uh, but i can add one plus one even though i asked the doctors it's very shameful what's happening in that country called Nigeria. I asked the doctors, I want to know the cause of the death of this guy. When they gave me the report, the cause of death, guess what they wrote? Death. Oh. <laughs> I said, give me the cause of death. He said death. Uh, so I was, it was, I mean, I was, I was so, so, but to, to support what Brother Corey did said, you have to, you can add one plus one, even though you may not have evidential proof or support. But hearing, you know, my dad, uh, I've shared it with, uh, you know, people that are close to me. One morning I was a little kid, very little kid, but old enough to understand conversations, adult conversations. Uh, I saw, I heard him, he was coming from. You know, he wasn't, uh, he was coming from the restroom and I heard him say, ah, kini ito shuga isha. She didn't say more than that. Uh, he didn't call it, he didn't call it diabetes. He didn't call it, but what they call it is ito shuga. So like, I don't know what to it. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. That's what I saw, exactly so. But he didn't sit down to say he had this, he's struggling with this. But you see, when you are struggling with something, you speak under your breath unconsciously. 
Like somebody can be around you and say some things unconsciously and you look at that like, oh, are you okay? And they are saying, and they are saying what they are going through. So what is, what is why, are we, why am I sharing this? Why are we sharing this? To help you, to help me. You know, you may not know the medical history of your family members because they are passed, like my dad passed 22 years ago, 22 years ago. But we can learn from some of those things by saying, okay, this guy said that thing out of, okay, like that. And then I can begin to add one or, one or two things together. And that may guide us. Every time I've gone to the doctor, so they asked me a question, uh, your father, your, I said, hmm, nobody has all these conditions in my family. But now, I tell them, I explain, I said, I don't have proof, but here's what, I don't have a medical report, but this is what I heard my dad said, and that's all I can tell you. So if you want to categorize him as having these conditions, that's okay. That's going to help you to help me. You know, that's okay. Praise the Lord. Any other question? Okay, God bless you, ma'am. Ma, I think so we'll I have take a... one more after you, okay. just in case. Go ahead, ma'am. I have a question about, um, like lately, the YouTube has become like a university. There's almost nothing you can't learn from <laughs> watching the YouTube. But um, I'm just thinking now, what do you think we can, um, how can we sort of separate what we're listening to? Because like a few days ago, I was raving about a video I watched about some supplements, one of my friends, and she made a statement like, since COVID started, you know, all these people just put on lab coats and sit down there. And, and I suddenly realized sometimes they're watching it just because they're wearing a lab coat or they have their background, you know, you sort of take what they're saying like, they're, you know, it's gospel truth. One thing I try to look at is if they're trying to sell something that I know maybe it's not 100%, but maybe that's even wrong, I don't know. I just wanted you to please share something else. Yes, that would be very difficult because like you said, there's so many things out there and it's hard to know who is true or not. Um, the thing is also using Google to find out the person's um, credentials. You can put the name in and find out. And you know America, there are reviews of the walls. You have the bad reviews, the good reviews and everything. But ultimately, going to um, real sites like the CDC site and the National Health Institute, NHI, um, will be a better way to get your health information. That will be straightforward. I'm very weary about um, uh, supplements that are a mixture of stuff because um, it's not measured and there's no, uh, you know, in this place, there's no FDA regulation or stamp of approval for it to be used. So just be very careful, especially if you're on other medications because of interactions and that is unknown. So I don't go beyond my vitamin C, my vitamin D. I don't do anything I can't pronounce properly. So just the best way to be safe. Final question, anybody? Okay. What are some tips for helping a child boost their immunity while they're in daycare without like getting sick all the time? Also, like a child in daycare that does get sick, how do you protect other members of the home that might Family. be real? It is very <laughs> difficult because the thing going around in daycare is viruses, and um, it's very hard. I, my daughter was a daycare baby. My son did not cope. Two, two months, I knew he was out. He had ear infection times three in two months. I was like, okay, I can't do this. Wow. So I pulled him out. Um, it's very interesting. It's very difficult because they get over one thing and then they, they, they bring something else. Children are in each other's space. They have no respect for personal space. So they're spreading their thing very quickly. Is, is difficult for you in the home, but what you can do is vitamin C. That helped me a lot, especially with COVID. I was, we, we, we were scared. When COVID started, we were really scared. Um, but I just did vitamin C and zinc, and if it comes on with stuffy nose, you wear your mask to protect yourself. 
because it's a virus. You get over that and get another thing. Um, since COVID, because in my hospital we're still wearing masks um, at children's, I've not gotten as sick as I used to because as a pediatric resident, you get sick the first week in the emergency room, you get well, second week, you get sick, third week, you get... So it's standard because there are different viruses. So that's why sometimes they say it's nice to start early so that by the time he's in kindergarten, the nose will just be running, but he'll, he'll be fine. Yeah, it's very hard. There's hardly, you can just do the regular multivitamins for him because also they're also picky at this age. They don't eat well. So just regular vitamins is what you can do. Hand washing when he gets home, get um, shower, yeah, get rid of the clothing, just to minimize that for the rest of the family. And if it's too much, wear masks. Okay, we'll stick, uh, we'll stick to you. That way we can close that thing. Sister Abigail. Um, mine is not a question, it's sort of a contribution. I will start by saying thank you for talking about supplement. I'm not a supplement person aside the vitamin C you talked about. And the reason for me is um, based on the kind of research I do and the work I do, um, we talk about there is nothing called selective toxicity. It might be more toxic to what you want it to attack, but it might also be toxic to something else. And so if I don't have a clear cut reason to take that supplement, why am I taking it? And so you saying it is just like confirming what I do because of what I know. And I want to say thank you for that. All right, let's appreciate Dr. Labo. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you, man. We appreciate you. Thank you for always being a blessing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the class today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You, you did it. You made it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, everybody. Service starts at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And by the grace of God, Pastor uh, Clement will be blessing us with a continuation and completion for now, for the class he started today. But please research, I think you, he will tell us more how to be a part of uh, the Financial Freedom Master Guide, the class that, you know, uh, he's talking about, he will tell us more tomorrow so that we can be a part of that class for our own financial freedom financial freedom i don't want to work anymore i don't want to work i don't want to work i mean i want to just wake up lead them prayers because that's where my work started starts lead those prayers and all that go to my gym exercise and uh, you know i want to be like uh, dr labo's dad i want to wake up and take walks Let's take a walk and come back. Just take a walk in the evening too, 30 minutes, and come back home and eat dinner at 6 p.m. and sleep very well. There's nothing wrong with sleeping. Thank God for the scripture that Dr. Labo used. The Bible says, God gives his beloved sleep. That's the word of God. And we have to take God at his word. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And you have to go. Remember I told you on Thursday, it's not just women, all of us go and create assets. By the grace of God, I think I will also take some time uh, in the future to differentiate assets for you because there are some things you guys call assets that are not assets. The house you live in, if you know you think it's an asset, it's not an asset because it's not generating cash flow. It's a liability in case you don't know. Anything that doesn't bring, that doesn't bring money to you is not an asset. The worst type of asset you think you have as a liability is your vehicle, your car. So if you like, you can go and buy a jet and be driving it and be riding it on the road in Northwest Arkansas so that they can know that you are wealthy. Hmm? I will never forget what this man of said today. The wealthy people are never arrogant. Did you hear that? Wealthy people, the real wealthy people, he said, they are never because they know that, you know, this thing that is happening, they didn't create it. No, you could not have created it. You see, if we invite you, if we say, come and talk about success, 
and you started talking about I did this, I did that, I did this, and there is no God in you know your message. We know that <laughs> it's not possible. Paul plant Apollo's water, but it's God that brings in grace. Meaning you can do all the effort. If God does not bless it, you will not have any success story to share. May the Lord crown your effort this year. Amen. Brethren, we have delivered by the grace of God different areas, all areas for you to prepare you for this year 2023. This is coming one month late, but you still have 11 months. Yes. We have to talk to you about what you need to do with your health. I wake up every day. The only time I have not gone, and I will still exercise today. I didn't get a chance to go to the gym yesterday, but I wake up, I do five, six days now. I do five, six days. I wake up after prayers, I fit my sneakers or whatever. As my wife is driving out, me too, I'm driving out to the gym. I went together. I'll go do my, you know, thing. Let me do my part and leave the rest unto God. Let me do my part physically. Let me do my part scripturally and leave the rest unto God. Are we together now? Okay? And so it's very important. We have taught you, we brought, you know, we have taught you on the area of health. Your health is number one. Don't neglect your family because of your business. The monies you are making, may you not use that money to go and be rescuing your children from drugs. Okay. Yeah. Eh? You understand what I'm saying? The children we are not paying attention to today, and they are challenging us tomorrow because we didn't pay attention to them. It's not the fault of the children. We have taught you, you see the battles we are fighting today, some of the battles we are fighting today in our families are avoidable battles. They are avoidable. If only we had paid a little bit more attention to our children. And that's why I've told you, you have you, those of you that have younger children, please, please, in the name of the Lord, don't allow anything whatsoever now they are under your roof. I only have six more months with my son, Mufet Oluwa, before he goes to college. I wish I can still go back with what I know today. I know that I still have 18 years, but I no longer have 18 years. I only have three months, four months, six months, and he's gone to college. And I commit him to the hand of the Lord. What a blessing you have that your child is two years old, your child is five years old, your child is six years old, and you are hearing this now. And so you are going to deliberate, you are going to deliberately parent your children with love, with your time. Sitting down and saying, and you're not going to say, well, Elizabeth is just five years old. What does she know? She knows something. You sit down with her, talk to her in the way she understands. Lizzie, how are you? What would you like daddy to do? What do you like mommy to do? I Today, you know, I started the Bible school late last year. I joined um, to, to learn a little more about Bible. And I mean, this is the first time this weekend that I have not been able to complete my class because of all that I have going on this week. And it really hurts me that I'm not able to complete my class this week. Maybe I can still complete it today or tomorrow. But I've learned a lot. And, you know, I felt like these are the things I should have learned the day I got born again. What I'm learning in the Bible school now. These are the things I should have learned before I even venture to say, when you say you are born again, all of these things we should have learned. May God forgive some of our pastors in Nigeria. Where you are raised matters a lot. And that's why the hope where we are raising these children matters a lot. It matters a lot. The way you are raising your children. You know, I plead with us. We have done, uh, see, Mommy Adeboye said something when he brought praise forward. Uh, by the grace of God, we are going to work with our brother in chapel of praise. Amen. Anybody know Pastor Praise? Yes. Okay. By the grace of God, we are going to work with him. I know I'm making this open confession, but by the grace of God, God will help us to work with him so that he can come and work with us here to develop a plan for our children's church and our youth church. 
we are going to do this thing called church here. We are going to do it differently this year. Deliberately, intentionally. Deliberately, intentionally. Mommy brought him to the camp. The camp. Anybody has listened to that message? Mommy brought him. Mommy, the way he brought praise to the pastor, praise to you know the camp, and he taught and taught. It's scary. The things he was saying, it was scary. Are you getting it? I think I will look for that message and post it so that you guys can listen to it. How you think you are wealthy? You have a driver. The driver is driving taking your children to school, but it's the driver that is sleeping with your daughter. Mm. Wow. Well, you're a big man now. You are so big. You have meetings with the governors and the senators, and you don't have the time to spend time with that, your daughter. It is that driver that didn't go to school, that is a very stinking driver, God forbid, God forgive me, that is teaching your daughter what sex means. I'm practicing it with that. I will go and take her from school. You say, hey, go and bring my daughter. Go, 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 what are you doing? Go and bring my daughter. You go bring your daughter. And before, between the times you bring the girl, before you come and deliver her in your house, she has, he has messed her up. Taking her to his house. And messed her up terribly. Or you have, you have a young lady, or even a young boy. And they have uncles and aunties. And these uncles and aunties are the ones teaching them evil. Because you are not there. Because you are not there. You think you are there. You think getting putting food on the table is your primary responsibility. It is not, sir. It is not, man. It's a total, total package. We have spoken to you about this. We have spoken to you about your health. We have spoken to you about your finances. We have spoken to you about your marketplace. We have spoken to you about taking opportunities and starting a business the ball is in your court and we are praying for you every day i know this year will be a year of total victory for all of us and so you have been empowered just go out there and bring testimonies back go and bring testimonies back the lord will help you stand on your feet as we pray and close our service will start at 9 a.m. tomorrow. 9 a.m. We're going to have just a short opening prayer, 20 minutes of worship, and we'll give the time to Pastor Oladi Kupo. And please listen, I will be praying on first fruit tomorrow. This is a practice by the grace of God we do in Chapel of Praise. We take a seed out of what God has blessed us in the year. We say, Lord, I come this year, you have blessed me with this, and here is what I have brought. Every time you get a new job, your salary, you should take part of it and bring it to God as your first fruit. Don't listen to some crazy teachings out there. And we are not telling you what we are not practicing. My wife is the first to bring four fruits to Chapel of Praise this year. You get me? So we are not starting. When I ask you to bring tight, I am a tight time. Tomorrow we are going to give you the statement on some of the offerings that you gave. If you gave using uh, 84321, you know that uh, 84321, you, are, you have access to your statement, given statement already. But if you need help, you can talk to us. But they want all the other methods, we are going to give you the report tomorrow. It's ready. But I will pray on that first fruit tomorrow. Children of God, we are in a walk, a conscious, deliberate walk with God. And we're not leaving anything onto chance. Father, thank you for this conference. Thank you. Shall we appreciate God for this conference? Lift up your voice and just appreciate him. Thank you for all of your sons and daughters that you have used for us. From Brother Tosi to Dr. Abby to myself. You know, to Pastor Ola Dipupo Clement, to Dr. Labo, thank you for every resource, human resource, every vessel that you have brought. Thank you for the impartation. Thank you for knowledge. Thank you for what you have in plan for each and every one of us. Mighty God, thank you for the results that we follow. Thank you for the new grants that will be broken. 
Thank you for new businesses that will break forth. Thank you for families that are restored already. Thank you for hearts that drifted away. But you are restoring. You are restoring. You are restoring hearts unto yourself. You are restoring families. You are restoring individuals. You are restoring health. You are restoring marriages. In the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you because Chapel of Praise is growing in leaps and bounds. In the name of Jesus. Our God and our Father, we give you praise. Our God and our Father, we give you praise. To God be the glory, great things in Pastor, so lovely, the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the light in that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Who call to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Father, for the great things you have done, we say thank you. Thank you. We commit tomorrow's service to your hand. We ask to God that you glorify yourself. Anoint your son afresh. Anoint him anew. In the name of Jesus. In the year 2023, this church, members of this church, and partners with us in ministry, that are not even members of this church, will experience supernatural breakthrough. Supernatural breakthrough. Supernatural breakthrough. Yeah. By the reason of the divine impartation of this weekend, Jesus of Nazareth, fallow grounds will be broken. Yeah. Opportunities will open up for every one of us. Yeah. Father, we lay out on the opportunities in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Whatever we have lost in the past, in terms of opportunity, I decree restoration in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Students, I pray for you. You have left the time and you have come to this conference day one, day two, day three, day four, and tomorrow day five. May God supernaturally, supernaturally gift you back the hours you have spent. Amen. Maybe you were supposed to be reading or studying, but you created the time. I pray for you that every one hour you have invested there, the Lord God of heaven will restore back unto you. Yeah. And he won't give it back to you in terms of just one hour. He will give it back to you in terms of favor with your instructors. Yeah. He will give it back to you for supernatural speed with the work that you do. Yeah. He will give it back to you with result of miracles in the studies. Yeah. In the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Thank you, Father. No one of you will fail. Amen. No one of you will fail. Amen. When you have to do your master's or PhD or bachelor's and you have to present before they approve your paper or approve your PhD or your funding, the Lord will help you. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ and all of our children that continues to come with us, we are doing this because of you, because we love you. We pray for you that God can rest upon you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercies are following me all the days of my life. I'm dwelling in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. In Jesus' name. 9 a.m. tomorrow, no late night.